Do you treat your dog as part of the family? <laughs> well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. And Nitro's Garage for all your automotive needs. Call 646-675-2349. That's 646-675-2349. For all your automotive needs, Nitro's Garage. Ask for Jack. It's fake news. All right, welcome back to another episode of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh, only seen here at Village Connection Radio, live from Rockstar Studios, a special Saturday edition. At the helm is none other than the owner of this illustrious station, Mr. Jim Savalli. Well, good morning. Jim or good afternoon. <laughs> to the right is the star of the show, Jimmy Farrow. Happy Saturday. And most importantly is WWE Hall of Famer, pro wrestling superstar, iconic human being, Mr. Tony Atlas. Tony Atlas. You know, I always wanted to meet him. Who's Tony that? Atlas? Tony oh, Atlas? He's I awesome. You'd love him. I think he's a prick. <laughs> really? Oh, no way, God. man. He's yeah. a good guy. Yeah. yeah. Good for nothing. Good for nothing. <laughs> well, we're going to find out in this okay. interview, all right? Yeah, let's find out. So what we usually do is uh, Farrow's going to do his little shtick, Ooh. and then we're going to we're gonna rock and roll with you, sir. Sound good to me. All Sounds All right. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have at it our esteemed introduction for our esteemed guest. Born April 23rd, 1954, Anthony White, better known by his ring name, Tony Atlas. American bodybuilder, powerlifter, professional wrestler, who's held multiple titles and championships in each of these sports. He's also known by his bodybuilding title, Mr. USA, a distinction he has earned three times. Also known as the Black Superman, as well as an alter ego named Saba Simba. F you, Vince. <laughs> anyway, yes, he returned as an on. I have to. Uh, F you, Vince. He returned as an on screen manager for WWE, which I personally loved, appearing on its now defunct ECW brand. And of course, he re signed with WWE with a Legends deal in mid 2012. Residence. Where are you living at, sir? I live in Auburn, Maine. Okay, all right. Not far from here. No. All right. 
multiple names as I've mentioned yeah, that, previously. You shouldn't, really, you shouldn't have really told the Pharaoh that, man, because you might just be visiting your home. I'm a bit of a too close. The only thing about Maine, once you go there, you don't want to leave. Really? I like professional wrestlers' feet. Nice, right? You're digging the cold weather? weather? Oh, sorry. It's no worse than New York or Chicago. Well, that's why I'm not a big fan of New York thing. anymore. But, but no, it, 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 it's just the freedom. You got more freedom there. No, no traffic. Nice. You can buy whatever you want to buy. Fresh air. It, fresh air. What, nice. what does Tony stuff. Atlas nowadays do for recreation? Tony Atlas uh, is a direct support. I work with mentally challenged adults. Mm. I'm also is a, a, a personal trainer. At the Auburn YMCA, I got a, a youth program there, and I work with uh, a young troubled kids. I do a lot of motivation speaking to uh, uh, to kids because uh, there's a lot of things that uh, that I was taught when I was young that we don't put into kids. Whatever it, my mother said, you reap what you sow. If you plant apples, you're not gonna get oranges. In my generation, there was two things that was planted in me. It was planted. They like you plant a seed in the ground. One was pledge allegiance to the flag every morning in school. I made a pledge to serve and honor my country. And then me, you know, not putting everything away about it. Me, I one day just decided I want to go to L.A. and get my face stepped on and not go to Philly. That's what me and S.D. were talking about at the Hall of Fame. They were going to put the belt on me and S.D. that night that we were going to beat Fuji and Saido. Really? I now? decided I don't want to wrestle. I'm tired. I want to have a vacation. This girl told me she got some new tennis shoes. You and S.D. were about to be the first. You believe this? this is unbelievable. S.D. would have been S.D. The first. must wa wanted to smack you senseless. He forgave me. He forgave <laughs> okay. me. He talked about it in the Hall of oh Fame. Oh, my God. And that's when Rocket took SD place. It was SD before Rocket. SD first delivered Joe. And I took away SD first break. Wow. Can I get your thoughts Over on that? Over a pair of tennis shoes. Over tennis shoes. A girl called me and said, I just bought these shoes. Oh, I can't man. wait to show them when you be home. Right. And, and like, I had this real, real strong foot fetish. You with right. toes, man. What's up with not, you? No, I, I got a, I got a, a, a shoe fetish. Shoe fetish. Okay. Not a foot fetish. Okay. There's a, a difference. Hold on. Interesting. Uh, 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 right. Skinsky. So when you, when you come back and SD now knows he, that, 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 that you he finally had you, right away he forgave it? No, it oh, took a while. It, it took a while, but, but later on, me and him, we started talking. And he knew that I was crazy. You know, I, I, I was all messed up, you know, messed let, with let me, let me Let me ask you a quick question. They, they put... They put the belts around you and Johnson, right. which yeah. in the day was huge. Yeah. I, I could remember that day like it was yesterday, both yeah. of you guys. What was your problem with uh, Rocky Johnson? Because the rumor has it is you guys just couldn't get along and they had to, they had well, to take a Well, me and Rocky talked later. That's what I thought at first. And I say some horrible things about Rocky that I take back now. But once me and Rocky was able to sit down and talk. But what was the original beef? What was the problem? Well... Me and Rocket never had a chance to, to bond. Now, think about it. We had the belt for almost a year, and we teamed up three times. Yeah. As Why? You, Why, that by what the SD way? you say all the time. He said, y'all the only guys they put the belt on, and they never promoted it. Why do you think that was? Senior put the belt on us. Oh, Senior made okay. that decision. Junior took it off. So Junior just didn't like it and didn't use it. Well, Junior it. was not in charge of 85. Senior uh, died gotcha. in 85. Gotcha. We won the belt in 82. Gotcha. Understood. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So it senior, sounds to me like Junior senior, just didn't like it and it wasn't let it his, sit. Well, it wasn't his creation. That's why when you go in, when I went back, Vince Junior never you never booked Tony Adams. I was doing the... Where the WWF then the same thing I was doing no work. In fact, I did less. And the owner at that time said, "I have to make an example of you, of all the people." See, so I, I learned long time ago that that people said, "No, it don't matter." Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, they do. To not to everybody, but in certain situations, it is it, done because. It, it, it's just something about human nature. 
you know, it ain't all of us. You know, we got this certain human nature that we pull for one side more than we pull. If you're Democrat, you pull more for a Democrat, and then nobody on the Democrat side could do anything wrong, and everything that go wrong is the other guy's fault, and I got nothing to do with it, even though I'm working too. You know, I'm there. You mm -hmm. know, I'm part of it, but I don't got nothing to do with it. Well, what the hell are you doing there if you ain't got no nothing to do nothing? You know, go home if you ain't got nothing. You know, if you ain't involved in nothing, what are you there for? But anyway, and then the, the same, you know, on the other side. So wrestling is pretty much the same way. When the crap hit the ceiling, you know, if you're not connected with, in with the right people or if you're not packing the houses, then the guys that pack the houses, you know, they, you can get away with what they, what they want. The guy that don't pack the house, he ain't going to get away with nothing and so on. Yeah, but, you know, at that time, you and Johnson are tag team champions, which is, by the way, one of the most important matches you, in the history of wrestling but, but if you look at all the matches during that time we had that belt that mm -hmm. we had together sg joe told me something he was laughing he said you know y'all two guys are the first two guys i seen that had that belt they didn't make no money with it you go back through the computer i asked anybody out there they look mm -hmm. at all the matches me and rocky had to defend that belt it's hard to find because we had nothing. Yeah, but yeah, but <laughs> Except I, when we won it, we but lost. It. Rocky kind of blames you for no showing no, events man. and doing well, all no, right. It wasn't so much. It wasn't so much that you know. Uh, it was. Uh, he I, said you wouldn't go to the smaller towns, you know. So he, you know, yeah. maybe he thinks well, that's there not was true. money to be drawn. Well, well, no, that 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 is not true. Uh, why would I? come back and screw up. Why would I do that? I gotta be a complete idiot. That's, I, I, that's Rocky Johnson that, talking. I, I have I, no idea, right? And, like I said, it don't read the other guy. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. No matter who you talk to. When you read my book, one thing that Scott Teal told me that, that he liked about my book, he said, Tony, you the first person that I would write a book for like this. He said, why is that? This, my statement in my book, Thousands and thousands and thousands of people helped Tony Atlas to get on top. Thousands of people helped Tony to get on top. Only one person helped Tony to fall to the bottom, Tony Atlas himself. Mm -hmm. I'm the captain of my own ship. When I came back, because uh, I, uh, I came back uh, from, from California uh, and went back to work, they put the, the title on me and Rocket. I tried everything in my power to make that thing work. I didn't miss no show. Chief J. Strongboat bagged them, bagged them to put SD on the show with us to make sure I get to the show. Rocky was a transportationer. Mm. I had to depend on Rocky for a ride. He was the man with the wheel. Right. I just flew in from California and went to work. I ain't had a car. Mm. See? So everybody want to blame their mistakes on Tony Atlas. It's easy to do to blame somebody else for a decision you make. I, I take full responsibility for everything I ever did, but I'm not going to own up to something that I didn't do. No, I didn't miss any shows. They got records, you know. You look it all up on the computer. Everything's on the computer. If I didn't miss a show, how come my name there? If I wasn't there. You know, that's a good point. That's right. You know they got records of all this stuff, man. You can get out and tell all the lies you want today. But they got a thing out here today with what is good about the internet called Facts Check. Adonis, Ventura, Patera, whoever, Patera. Patera. Yeah. And then they drop, it just makes no, let, yeah. let me ask you what this. Is you, uh, you and the Soul Man, you end up dropping the belts to Adonis and Murdoch. Do you share any thoughts on Adonis? A lot of guys have come through and they say Adonis, he wasn't a very good guy. Yeah, we Adonis was the most disrespectful. Oh, here we go. Most degenerate. Get out. Individual I have met in my life. In your life, really? Now, what, why? What, what did he? What was he just rude he to you? Had, he hell was or? rude, obnoxious, racist. Hell of a hell of a Is hell he of racist. A, uh, or just an equal opportunity asshole. You got that right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't so much. Uh, Fair um, enough. So so much race because all of us, whether we want to realize or not, we got a little bit of racism in us. Sure.
uh, Jimmy Snuka and Nancy Argentina. Did you know anything that went on in that situation? I wasn't there. I wasn't Were you there. close with Snuka at all? Oh, it made you... me. Oh, I, well, I love Jimbo. I still like him. I, I like Jimbo a, a, a whole lot. Well, what did you hear about the situation? How's that? I'm not asking whether you know. Just what did you hear, and did Jimmy ever talk to you about anything? No, I mean, Jimmy never discussed that. You know, you know, we really never did uh, discuss about what happened with him and that girl. I, I knew that they was uh, were dating for a while, and uh, my what, what, what was she? My I think my second or third wife mm -hmm. was used to date him. You know, but uh, there was probably about maybe twenty different stories went out on that about what what happened with that girl. But I think the. A guy called me, he supposed to be what I call a DA guy mm -hmm. from the district attorney. Right. <laughs> Probably, you know, when they want to reopen the case stuff, sure. he, he called me, he asked me a uh, 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 question about it. But uh, he said that what the court papers say and what Jimmy said in his book don't match. And that's why they're going to wanted to reopen the, the case. So that's going to be kind of like an OJ mystery mm -hmm. in the rest of the world for many, many years. Only person that really know what happened in that room was Jimmy and that girl. Hmm. I don't. Nobody else was around when it happened. And they're both gone. And they're both gone. Yep. So you know you're gonna hear a hundred and one story of speculation. I, I even repeated some of the speculation, you know, which I stopped doing because it, I, you know my wife, you know, God bless her, she said you gotta stop repeating what people say when you, you wasn't there, you know, because. Well, in shit. the wrestling business, I, I keep forgetting myself that guys love to exaggerate. They want to be a part of it. <laughs> I think everybody likes to exaggerate, man. Everybody do that? Everybody. It's not just wrestling. Okay. Yeah. And, and so I, I got to be careful not to exaggerate and, and put myself into something just to be part of well, it. Well, I don't want you to speculate, but you're kind of yeah. blowing this next question out. Uh, well, what, are your thoughts anyway. on the, what are your thoughts on the Benoit murders? Now, that's another one. See, I was in Maine. That was in Texas. That's another one that I used to speculate on that I stopped speculating. You can see on. No more speculating. <laughs> no more speculation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody's a freaking psychologist now. This before a while Tony Adams thought he was, you know. You can fan a hundred and one tapes of me saying that yeah, you know I know what I'm right. you know, I went to Lee, you know, <laughs> Lee Junior High School and I almost passed the sixth grade, but I know this. And if, and I've have done that. I have done that and I gotta stop doing that. So no more speculating. No more speculating. I mean I well, right now he won't, but I'll probably, tomorrow I'll probably speculate again. Well, but as Tony Farrow, you're not speculating. No, Tony Farrow don't speculate. All right, that's all, uh, that's all I want to know. You heard it here. <laughs> Let's the Farrow, baby. Look, he's got the Farrow. Oh, nice. I like that. Interaction between you and the iconic uh, Bruno Sammartino. Did you have any interaction oh, with yeah, him? Yeah, yeah. Got any mean, stories to tell? Well, Bruno and me, we was uh, when we was around each other. It wasn't about no wrestling. It about lifting. Yeah, me and Bruno, we real about that. We were about lifting them weights, you know. Hey, kid, uh, I, I hear you did. You broke my record today because I, <laughs> I was in uh, Pittsburgh and uh, me, Tito Santana. Uh, a moment, Axe Demolition, all of them was at the gym. We were all in there working out at the gym uh, upstairs there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I bench pressed 565 that day. Wow. And uh, Bruno heard about it. So Bruno come back to, oh, kid, I hear you just broke my racket. And I said, I said what was your racket? He said, uh, 560. He said, it's only about five pounds. Just five pounds. You know, only five pounds. You know. but, but you broke my record. Only five pounds. You know, yeah. He pat me on the back. I love Bruno. So, but I love Bruno, man. Bruno was the type of guy uh, that he, you know, he he looked like a wrestler. He, he looked the part. He, he was a wrestler. You know, he, he was legitimate. That's what I was saying about when you got a guy sitting in the office writing a strip uh, for you. And you got to go out and play something that you never had no experience at in your entire life. So people are not stupid. People know that this don't something is not 
it don't click. It's just something that don't click. It's kind of like I was with uh, McIntyre. Uh, uh, Drew McIntyre? Yeah, yeah Drew McIntyre uh, last night. The what, what he's doing that fits him, you know. It have to, things have to fit. I, I remember I was watching this uh, television program about Hercules. And the, the, the modern one, the, mm -hmm. the modern lives, you know, yep. when he reality Hercules. Then I look at that guy, you know, he ain't got no muscles. <laughs> now, when you see Hercules, you no know muscles. Well, and he was with Zena for a while. Remember the Zena? Yeah, yeah, sure, that sure. Guy, okay, you thought about it. He had the long hair yeah, and stuff. Yeah. He, he, you know, he don't look like no Hercules, but they got it. They paint him money to play something that he it don't fit. In the older days, if you meet Ric Flair, Ric Flair is the same inside, outside, in bed, out of bed. You know, that's Flair. His in, that's his inner character, and we was able to do that. We were able to release that inner character right. in us. And you can't create. I can't make you what you not. You know, I can't make him what he's not. I can't make him what he's not. I can't make nobody. If you're not that, you just ain't that. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I, when they put belts on certain people, I, I look, I say, come on now. I ain't going to call no name, but come on now. Yeah, go ahead. You could call some names. No, come on. Yeah, I ain't going to Should do I that. call him for you? No, because my, I, the Kofi person, Kingston? The, well, <laughs> is that, you know, uh, but. Finn Balor? <laughs> you rough. I can keep going. You rough. <laughs> You rough on a man. Yeah. He rough on By the way, this is only man. the views of Monty from Monty and Tony Farrow. Tony Farrow had is not agreeing with what I'm saying. I'm just throwing names I out say, there. I, I don't agree with you. I just said that I, I, another thing that I learned in the business, you know, the man is not here to defend himself. So, you know, I, I kind of feel, that, you know, but regardless of what I'm saying is that it got to fit. You know, pe people get tired of being screwed. All right, Tommy Wildfire Rich. Love him to death. I got a lot of... He broke my neck, though. And this is a funny story. Uh, that's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> we were driving back one night, and, and Tommy had this bad habit. If you're sitting behind him in a car, he would turn all the freaking way around and looking at you going down the highway. <laughs> and he used to do that all the freaking time. This one time on them crooked roads up in Ohio, he he done that crazy stuff, and he went up. He he always told me the same thing. Relax, I got it, you know. And but this one time he did it. It's always that one time. You don't y'all do it twice to learn your lesson. Only once now. We went off the side of the road. Now there's a lot of people involved in this story. We went off the side of the road. <clears throat> the car flipped over. The hood was bent all the way down to the door knob. I was sleep in the back, so. I was wrenched down into the seat like this. Oof. And the top, the hood was on my head like this. The other guys were the, the Johnny Rich, uh, the other guy that was, uh, 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 what was his name? Son, hot dang it. Oh, he was a referee. Oh, I can't think of the poor kid name right now. But, but anyway, let me tell you a story. If your name pop up, I'll throw it out there. But anyway, <clears throat> so they, they were waiting for the jaws of death to get me out. Wow. Uh, the Sheik was riding with Ole Anderson, the Iron Sheik. He said, who's who's down there? And then they said, Tony Atlas, he's trapped in the car and you know, gas is leaking and smoking. And they said, they, he's going to get burned alive if somebody don't get him out. The Sheik ran down and ripped the door off. Yeah, yeah. Under that moment, of, ripped the freaking ass the Sheik next time you see him. That's like Hulk strength. Well, you could do that with... Cause they went for the door, but he came and pulled the door, got the wow. door open, and the sheik, the iron sheik, got me out the car mm. before he caught on fire. 
Wow. The Aaron Sheet. So I'll be dead now if it wasn't for Sheet. So you're That's forever, in, you're I, forever I, in debt I, to Sheet. I ain't never say anything bad about Sheet. Because I see how the Sheet are all in time with me. He didn't even think. And only told him, say, he's a baby face, which means good guy. Mm. Sheik is healed. He said, if you go down there, I'm going to fire you. Wow. But the Sheik just ran and, he, and pulled it, got the door open, got me out, got me up on there. So I, got, I went to the hospital there. So Can I'm you there. believe that? Tony is about to die, and the promoter's telling the other guy, you can't break kayfabe. Yeah. Don't go down there. Yes. Yeah. Holy honest God cow. Truth. Honest, honest God truth. Honest God truth. This was Ole Anderson with, with Georgia Championship Wrestling there. But uh, anyway, because uh, that TV we were going to Ohio then. We just started going to Ohio and Will in West Virginia. Anyway, they put me in the hospital. I was there for about maybe three days. I was unconscious. I don't know how long I was there. But anyway... They, when I got out, they put a halo on me, right. on my head. Mm-hmm. They go, they wires. I look like Frankenstein. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they said, oh, oh, take that fucking thing off. Take that fucking thing off. He said, I don't want the people to see you like 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 this. He said, he said I got anger. I got a freaking anger for you. So he had me to take the halo off, put my elbow up on the turnbuckle, hold my chin like this, and Buzz saw you. Uh-huh. Maybe, to come in with a two by four that's supposed to be gimmick you know, yeah, to yeah, some yeah. Of it, and then you know put stuff around it so you don't see it and whack me in the head and break the two by four in my head buzz who was always but let's just say you were okay with buzz doing that i mean that's not, a scary situation well, in itself. i didn't know him then we didn't know each other you got to realize we young i didn't know him a from apple butter i didn't know he's going to come in with the uh, with the two by four hit me in the head with it but buzz was so stoned that morning he forgot to saw it a little bit. Mm. So it was a, nothing wrong with that two by four. And I got a, just coming out the hospital with this halo. And I'm up here just like this. And they come in here and he hit me. Well. I love it. This is incredible. My good friend here asked me to do some of the guys that have been on the Monte and Farrell show. And I try my dumbbell best to catch everybody's character. If you notice. Tony Atlas taking up all the room as usual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, with the biggest head. Yeah, I got the biggest head. Uh, you know. or, or, I'm sorry, the biggest body, but the smallest yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, the smallest head, but that's <laughs> fit Tony Atlas. You know. That's Tony Atlas, the biggest body and the smallest head. Been like that for years. But then I try to put some of my friends in, and, and uh, you know, this is a fantastic show. You know, I, I, I was telling the guys earlier, there are just as many wrestlers that have been on this program that have been in the WWF or WWE. This is an amazing, amazing uh, thing they got going here. You know, a lot of us guys, like some of the guys that are that I travel with and wrestle with, like Bundy. We were talking about Bundy not too long ago. I was sitting beside him. Now Bundy's no longer here. But the Pharaoh could say that, that, that at one time y'all watched the Martin and the Pharaoh show and you saw him because of what these guys do. So this is a great thing, uh, you guys, that what, what they do. I mean, how, how can you sit in here in depth stuff about Tony Atlas if it wasn't for the Marty and Farrell show. You know, how, how can you hear stuff about the Aaron Sheet, Tito Santana, Greg Valentine? I mean, every wrestler on here had, had lived a different lifestyle, a different story, different territory, different nationality, Spanish, Black, Caucasian, Puerto Rican, you know, Indian. You know, you got, like, it's like a freaking United Nation here. You know, everybody got a different upbringing, a different story, a different experience. And they all have been on a modern and fair show. So, I don't know if y'all appreciate what y'all seen, but to me, you know, I knew a lot of these guys, like Andre the Giant. And I, I knew guys that uh, that have been on this show that's no longer here to tell their stories anymore. So, if you get a chance to see one of us guys, take advantage of it. We ain't going to be here forever. We the last of the Mohegans. The, the end of the wrestlers. We was not sports entertainers. We was wrestlers. And we wouldn't put nobody over that couldn't beat us in real life. We try to not screw the people and show the people something that we were not. The Tony Atlas you've seen on TV is the same Tony Atlas you're going to meet in person. The, the Ric Flair you meet on TV is the same Ric Flair you're going to meet in person. Bundy was Bundy up until he died. Razor Ramon, we immediately we stayed Razor Ramon. But Ramon. They, they, they was not character. The character was the person themselves.
my day, my day, was turning fantasy into reality. In other words, make the people believe that what you're doing for real. Mr. USA Tony Atlas, we have not seen him since the big event which we worked the gimmick table at the MMP table with superstar, UWF superstar, Mr. Sonny Beach. Ooh. Then Corona hit, yeah, and bam, here we are. Tony, you're looking great. Thank you, my friend. What are you doing to protect yourself against Corona, my friend? Well, like I, uh, I was pretty lucky. I was raised in a generation where the parents was in charge of my diet, not the kids in charge. So if, if all y'all my age or younger, remember your mom always say, eat your veggies. Mm. Where's well, the reason for eating veggies? 50% of the human uh, body should consume, 50% uh, should be fruit and veggies. 30% veggies, 20% fruit. What that do, it build one immune system. They have not the coronavirus, but they have virus on this earth for many years, in 1918, a virus hit mm -hmm. hit the world and killed 50 million people. One of the reasons why some people catch it and some people don't, it all boils down to your immune system. Mm. See, God gave every animal protection, and we got what's called an immune system and antibody that 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 fights any any uh, cold, flu, or anything that hit us. But but when your immune system falls, then you become more acceptable to diseases, and, and most, if you add, look at most people, people don't eat veggies no more. When well, they tell you to wash your food off before you cook it, right? And you take that steak and you stick it underneath the water, right away it turns brown. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fresh. It's hard to get fresh meat. Mm -hmm. Because like, let's say you buy ham. That ham was killed in April in North Carolina, and you got it on your table six months later, in Maine. I'm going to stick to Twinkies. <laughs> this sounds terrible. I don't want to ha I, I ham from April. Tony, have you ever eaten a Twinkie in your life? Yeah, yes. you have. Get yes, out. You have? you have? Oh, yeah. A whole box, too, probably, yeah. right? Yeah. I eat there sweets. You, go. you got the munchies. Yeah, but it's a Twinkie, with dude. The like, well, who I eats a Twinkie? What? what? Twink Twink is good as hell. I eat Twinkies. Yeah. Dude, you know how long it takes for a Twinkie to rot? Like, if you put it... Now I'm not going to want Twinkies. It takes, like, 40 years for a Twinkie to, what? like... Not, Is that what they removed during my surgery? Well, I'll tell, wow. tell you, I'll tell you, when I eat a Twinkie and I blow it out my butt, <laughs> it felt like it, it only been there overnight, <laughs> but it felt like it been laying around for a hundred years. That's it's a good thing you didn't have some shock of oh I don't know. We were, we were doing that virtual uh, meet and greet, and I smell a few Twinkies while I was, oh, yeah. while I was in the room with you. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts or any uh, kind of inside info about Owen Hart or the, the, the night of his death? The Owen Hart incident and the Bruiser Brody incident to me were similar in this respect. When I came back, after taking Brody to the hospital, when I came back to the dress room, all the wrestlers was laughing and joking like nothing happened. A person died, was murdered right in front of them, and it went unnoticed by the wrestler. All they didn't wrestle were thinking about was their match. When Owen Hart fell to his death, the show went on. Mm. Back in the dress room, nobody was talking about Owen Hart's death. All they were talking about was how great their match was. And wrestling is the strangest, it's different than any sport in the world. Boxing probably is the closest to it. Because wrestling is an individual sport. You don't have friends in wrestling. You have business associates. Mm. It's a dog, as MacDonald Vachon would say, wrestling is a dog-eat-dog -dog sport, and you have to get your bite out of it. Right. Look at how many wrestlers died over the years, and you hear guys walking around acting act like nothing happened. Right. They're not missed by none of the wrestlers. Hmm. The fan missed them. When Piper died, the fan missed Piper, but not the wrestlers. Mm. Piper family missed them, but not the wrestlers. The show must go on. 
So to these guys, when when one wrestler is not around, it's more room for them. I don't want nobody out there say, oh, Tony had to say this about my buddy. I didn't say that. What? You Let's didn't say, say that? Example, you didn't say it was yeah, Owen yeah. Hart was high? Well, well I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know his condition. I, you know, I wasn't there when Got gotcha, you, right. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know his condition. But I said, let's suppose, suppose right. that he were. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if, if you're on cloud nine and you 20 feet in there, something bad going to happen. Yeah. It's like if, if you drink 20 beers and get behind the wheel of your car, something's going to happen. Sometimes things just happen unexpected. I'm very sure that Vince McMahon wished it never happened. I, I'm sure, I agree. I'm, I'm very sure that, 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 that he, but the show was still must go on. Wrestlers are not friends. they business associates. Mm. The first time I, I never knew Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I seen him, I knew of him for 20 years, but never knew him one-on-one -on -one until we did Legend House. Mm. You know, you remember we were saying that. Mm -hmm. Me and Piper never spoke a word the whole time we were in the business until legend. And house. then you gave everybody pig's feet. Nice job, Tony. Yes, yes. So, That's like, rough. all wrestling fans know the historic night when you and Rocky Johnson won the, won the tag belts, right? Right. Many people that watch this show also know that the spot was originally meant for S.D. Jones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had some problems, and mm -hmm. it kind of caused S.D. a spot. But from knowing you... You and SD are pretty close. Can you explain to the fans what kind of man SD Jones was? Underrated. Un in, in a real fight. In a real fight. Okay. SD Jones probably could whoop him. I used to go to gym with <laughs> SD Jones, and SD, what was so strange about it, he could incline press more than he could bench press. Wow. I now that's impressive. Do that. That's impressive. He's he could he could take four hundred and five pounds really? and do it ten times on the incline. Wow. We used to do curls, me and S D. S D used to take two hundred and twenty five pounds and curl it. Mm. I was squatting six hundred, S D squatted six hundred. You were my training partner. Damn. Was S D a true friend? S D was definitely a true friend. So there are friends in wrestling then? There are friends in wrestling. I'll tell you a story about S D. When Vince first kicked me out of wrestling, I went to, to uh, I, I called Vern Gagne out in AWA. He said, yeah, I, I would love to have you in, Tony, but it's going to be a month before I bring you in. So I checked into a, the Ramada Inn on, on, on 49th and 8th Street. SD told his wife where I was at, his wife Kate, and I talked to her quite frequently. Kate said, tell Tony, to come here and stay. I don't want him, he ain't gonna have no money left. He paid five, six hundred dollars a week at that hotel. Mm -hmm. He could come here and stay. Mm -hmm. So as he came and started packing my bag, I said, what are you doing? He said, Kate wants you at the house. Kate wants you at the house. We gotta go, gotta go to the house. Kate, gotta go to the house. There it is. <laughs> Kate wants you, Kate wants you. Yeah, that's what, what SD. Like? And uh, so he's like, he packing my bag. <laughs> so I slept in his, um, in his son's room. His name was Jermaine. So they gave me his son's room to sleep in. Well, I didn't just lay around. I mean, I did yard work. I helped Kate around the house. One day, SD came home. He said, I think I've lost my job. I said, why is that, SD? He said, Vince Jr. told me this. If I don't get Tony Atlas out of my house, he's going to fire me. What? Why? And I said, what you tell uh, uh, Vince? He said, I, he said, I, he said, Tony, my friend, I can't do that to my friend. Mm. So I said, well, no, SD, I don't want you to lose your job for me. I said, I go back to the hotel. And then I, uh, luckily for me, SD, cousin, they call him Bigfoot. Because he had these, like, size 15 shoe. He was on, like, 6'4", but he had, his, like, a you know, <laughs> size 15 shoe. They called him Bigfoot. So he said, hey, you're only going to be here for about two more weeks. You come and hang out at my place for a couple of weeks, you know? And I said, okay. I said, I pay you. He said, no, just, you know, just help out with the food. He said, just pay for your own food. He said, I can't feed you. Right. He said, but it ain't going to cost me nothing for you to sleep on my couch. But I, mm -hmm. you know, you just buy your own food. Mm -hmm. So I said, cool. So I left, and SD was able to uh, able to uh, uh, keep his job. You know, if you watch the whole thing, SD tell our, our, our story. What happened was, I left, I walked out on Vince and went back to L.A. And I... Uh, and the same night, the same night that me and me and SD were going to be uh, win the world title 
from at that time Fuji and Saito, which would have been incredible. Yeah, and then the idea was to bring the Moon Dogs. They was in Japan at the time. Okay, bring them back. They were going to feed us for the belt. Okay, now to answer your question, then they were going to have me put me in singles to go against Backlund to make me the first black world champion, but I wow. walked out on him. That's, oh, why, that's why I didn't get the belt. Uh, had nothing to do with Vince. Tone. Had, I did that myself. I need one thing answered that's always bothered me, and I want the truth. When Albano hits, I don't know if it was off of Seek, over the head with that chair, was that chair gimmick, or did they really take a wood no, chair? They, in the olden days, they didn't gimmick nothing. Wow. That was old school. They wanted the people to hear the sound. See, if you give it, you're not gonna get that crack with oh, we heard it. Break. You heard it. Oh, yeah, heard you it. have to. You you want you don't get that with something that's gimmick. Those chairs looked old fashioned too. They look like something you see on right. the Walton set. Those a lot were... of guys, a lot of guys used to do stuff like that back uh, yeah. back back in the day. Like you ever hear of a guy? You know, you get juice. Some guy used a razor blade. Y'all know mm -hmm. that, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. But you ever hear the old term, "do it the hard way"? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gene Ow. Anderson had a, a a way up, and Harley Race could do it too. They could open you up with their fist. Harley could hit you mm. and cut you. Just with their fist. Yeah, Gene Anderson could do that, too. He was Ole Anderson, partner called the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Yeah. Gene yeah. and Ole Anderson. Yeah. They could use their fist and open you up. Now, a lot of guys would use the turnbuckle. There's a screw that sticks out about that far. Mm. And they would hit your head on it and drag your head across it. Okay. They call that doing it the hard way. You you you, you and your career didn't take a lot of color though, right? You you didn't. Oh no, we everybody got color back you, in them days. You had a lot of color. Color back in them days, you would never be a main eventer. Right. Yeah. With they came, because most of the matches, most of the matches back in them days had color in it. People came to see the blood. If they didn't right. get no, if they had a, if you had a wrestling match in 1975 and nobody bleed, ain't nobody coming back. Right. See what stopped the color was AIDS. Okay. Look at a picture. Of, okay. Look, look at picture of Bruiser Brody. Every picture he got blood. Look at Dusty Rowe. Every picture got blood. Mm. There's picture okay. of me on the internet with blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, there's always pictures of wrestling with blood. Interesting. That was okay. that what drew, where the people saw the blood. And what we used to do, we used to we want the people to see the cuts. We would get right up to a person so they could see the open room. Mm. I remember one time a guy told me, oh. Uh, that that's ketchup. That's not real. I would pull the band-aids off, smack it, and bleed right on him, right on him. And then they said it's real. Because our our job, we were wrestler. We were not sports entertainer. Mm -hmm. See, the object of wrestling in my day, my day, was turning fantasy into reality. In other words, make the people believe that what you're doing for real. Sure. So we were what they call very stiff. Sure. Like none of the, we didn't pull punches. We laid in punches. We just know where to hit. The guys talked to uh, I. I hit Gene Anderson one day in the ring. He was one of the guys. Him and Gene and Ole helped train me. And Larry Sharp. Larry Sharp later started the Monster Factory. Mm -hmm. He also trained Bam Bam Bigelow. But I was I was Larry Sharp's first student. People don't know that. Okay. So uh, one of, I hit Gene Anderson with a forearm. Gene said, "You." F you with them big <laughs> arms you got is that as hard as you can hit i want to apologize my language but that's how these guys talk sure. i'm telling you the way they said it so i drew back and i hit him as hard as i could hit him he said oh yeah that's how you do it lay them in kid what do you know about that what, situation the nancy argentina, the, nancy argentina. The, the girl my second wife her name was lisa okay she was jimmy slooker girlfriend before she was my girlfriend I was not in the room when it happened, but the girl that I married to was in the room. What did in she fact, say? In fact, y'all don't know this. Right before Slooker passed away, the the DA of Pennsylvania called me and tried to get a hold of Lisa. Mm. Mm. He tried to get a hold of her because she was an eyewitness to her. See, what happened was, this is what she said. Back in the day, the guy was doing the nose cannon, the cocaine, right? Sure. Slooker did an eight ball that day. <laughs> That's three and a half gram. He did it that whole day. Hey. So at the end of the night, he ran out by nighttime. He told the girl to go get him some more. She went to get him some more. What Nancy, yeah, it's Nancy to go get more. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay. With Lisa. With Lisa. With Lisa. The guy won't sell him anything. 
because it was after hours. He said, that Slooker hit her. Mm. And she fell. I said, what you do? She said, she ran. And she said, that's why I came to you. She said, because I knew that he would not come after me when I'm with you. She said, all I want is my purse. She left her purse in the mm. room. Okay. But she was wondering if anybody, did I hear it about, or anybody know where her purse was at? Mm-hmm. So she told me all this after we had sex. I'm laying in bed with this woman, and she's telling me all this stuff, you know? Wow. I never told anybody. I stayed out of it. Right. I didn't go to the police. I didn't say because I was not a witness. It was all what's called back in the old days, called that hearsay. Mm-hmm. And I, finally, what happened was what the DA told me, that Slooker wrote a book. And so the guy, he bought the book, the DA that, that prosecuted that case, he bought the book. Because he knew that the case was gonna be in it, so he could read to see if his if his name was in it. Mm-hmm. And when he read the story, he never heard that story before. Mm. So he went back and searched the the court records and found out that they told one story at the trial, and there's another story in the book. That's why they reopened the case. According so, to what Lisa said, he hit her. He, and, he, and I said, I said they hit her hard. He said, she said, you ever seen The Exorcist? Oh, oh yeah. man. With the girl head turned yeah. around? Yeah. That's what he said. He said her head turned right around. Drugs. Yeah. A, a drug could change a person. Especially, especially that cocaine. stuff. Yeah, yeah especially sure. that well, stuff. We used to not mess with cocaine. Right. I mean, it changed me. I mean, cocaine made me walk out on a world championship. Yeah. Okay? So cocaine can make yeah. you... Yeah, if, you know, you get drunk. Did you ever do an eight ball by yourself? I'm impressed no, that somebody no, could dead. do an eight ball by themselves. I could never drink as much. Okay. See, I had a 4% body fat. So I do this, I'm messed up mm. for the whole night. And in the morning, <laughs> I got muscle cramps. Oh. That's why I didn't make the show. Oh. See, drugs, if you don't have no body fat, is not to resolve it. So it dehydrated my muscles because I had no body fat, you see? Right. So it dehydrated my muscles. I had serious uh, uh, muscle cramps, and so I had to lay in bed the next day to recuperate. Every time I did drugs, I had to recuperate the next day. I couldn't do drugs and go perform that night. Right. I couldn't do drugs and perform the next day. Yeah. These guys could do it, go in the ring, come back, do it, get up the next morning. They was, it was like their body was immune to it. I was what you call a jock. And the only reason I did it, because I wanted to be one of the boys. I wanted to fit in. See, but that was so my decision to try to fit in. Because I had people like Chief J. Strongbolt, they told me to stay away from God. S. D. Jones, he said that he said that in the Hall of Fame. I tried to keep Tony away from them guys. There was always guys that tried to get trip you up. Like Mr. Fuji, even if you didn't do drugs, Mr. Fuji would give you a cookie. With L S D in it. Good old Fuji. <laughs> Uncle Elmo would ask you to, if you got you said if your back hurt, he said, Hey brother, I got a, a nice pain pill here. For you, he Uncle Elmo would give you a pill and sit back like this and look at you. You pop that pill and the room started spinning around. Guys would do that as a joke. Mm. Mr. Fuji would pee in a uh, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, shampoo bottle. You know that that Johnson shampoo <laughs> that was kind of brown, the brown, yeah. He would fill half of it with urine and he would go around. Dressing. Anybody want to use shampoo? Good shampoo. Want to use shampoo? Good shampoo. <laughs> Fuji fed a guy roadkill one time as a joke. Oh, no. That's took just... a dead dog off oh, the road, took it home now. and cooked it, and, and invited the rest over and fed yeah, it to him. Fuji was insane. evil, dude. Yeah. Yo. Johnny Valentin, Johnny Valentin, one time a guy was dressed, <laughs> I can't remember his name, he had asthma, took the asthma stuff out, put lighter fuel in, the guy took... <sighs> These guys did this for real. <laughs> Ronnie Garvin would come up behind you. We driving down the highway. Ronnie Garvin come behind you, put his front bumper against your back bumper, and start pushing you down the highway at 80 miles per hour. <laughs> to these guys, this was a real. They used to take guys out there, a mother gun and all them guys at Flair in Norfolk. They were hanging away with the KKK. Mm. They would get a black guy. They had a cheer. They had floats on the side of it. And they would dope the guy, strap him to a chair, put him in the water in North of Virginia, and then put blood, chicken blood, in the water to draw the shark. What? And, and every time the shark come to bite the guy, they pull on the rope. What? <laughs> You're close friends with Mark Henry, I'm assuming, right? Oh, okay. okay. Um, 
He made a statement about uh, about Leo Rush. He, Henry of... said Leo Rush got released because he didn't work hard enough. Uh, Leo Rush was also known he's one of the guys that refused to carry the bags for the veterans also. He preferred to do what now? Uh, you know, because you had told me when you were going through the industry, right? You would carry Dick Murdoch's bag. We were just yeah, talking about right. that today. Yeah. Leo that, Rush yeah. refused. He felt it was degrading um, to carry bags. This is what I told Mark Hendrick. <clears throat> I say, Mark, you are the first, the first black wrestler to work for the W. WF or WWE that didn't fuck up. Interesting. Period. He was the first. He stuck in there. He hung in there. He made a good name for himself. Mm -hmm. He entertained the fans. He did what he was told to do. Mm -hmm. See, Mark understood that he got an opportunity to make life good for his family. He understand that it's a business. Wrestling is entertainment like a movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of guys with this degrading stuff, I think it would be more degraded for Mark Henry. All the guys that thought like, uh, what's that guy's name? Leo Rush. Leo Rush mm -hmm. never made it. No. People don't want to, they don't want that type of attitude. Mm -hmm. Mark Henry got the best attitude of any wrestler in the WWE. See? Is Mark Henry underrated in Vince your mind? Vince took this. Yes. Thank Vince, you. But you see, Mark Henry paid for us. Mark Henry made Vince trust black athletes again. See, Vince Sr. <coughs> loved Ernie the Cat Lad. Oh. Loved him. Yeah. In fact, Ernie, by the Vince Sr. came to me and said, the reason that we booked you, Tony, is because you was recommended by my best friend, uh, Ernie the Cat Lad. Ernie Lad. He said, I don't care what people tell you. He said, if it wasn't for Ernie Lad, you would not be here. They had the utmost respect for Ernie the Cat Lad, who was a black man. Mm -hmm. I screwed up. Rocket screwed up. Yeah. JYD, he would have did, would have been as big as Hogan or anybody. But as, as all you know, he double screwed up. He did his job. But he got involved with mm. the drugs that messed his career up. Sure. Every black person that ever been in this business, people ask me one time, say, Tony, was there much racism in the business? I said, every black person I knew was a main eventer. They got a business to run. That's what this kid don't understand. Mark Henry is a businessman. Mark Henry and Lauren, the checks were coming, and they never did nothing to hurt Mark. What did they do to, to, to hurt him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Thoughts on Ahmed Johnson while we're on bad attitudes behind the scenes? Any any thoughts That's, on? Well, see, there, there you go. See, some people feel that the world owes them something. Okay. And unfortunately, for a lot of my people, they think they owe them something for slavery. Really? Mm. Like right. I saw the shirt that he was complaining about. Mm -hmm. I don't see what he see. Interesting. He said it was racist. I I. I I look at it. I, I I don't see what is racist about it. I mean, somebody gonna make a shirt of you. Look at the booty -o. you know, funny looking, yeah. fat album looking guy. Yeah. When you were doing the blow and you blew it, and they were gonna make you world champion, were they gonna turn you heel against Bob Backlund? No. Wait a minute. Was Bob gonna be turned to heel? Someone yeah. had to. Bob Backlund was gonna be a heel. Me and Backlund had one match. It was in Baltimore, Maryland, and I won. Really? Okay. Title match. Uh, uh, you pinned him? You pinned him? No, no. What happened? I leaped from him. <laughs> I, I leaped from him, and Backlund raised up, and his head hit me in the crotch, and and they and they DQ Backlund and raised my hand. Wow, interesting. And we wow. Still come back for the rematch after we dropped the title, but it was already working towards that. Wow. And Lou Albano said, "Tony, if you don't mess up, Freddie Blassett and Lou Albano said, if you don't mess up." He said, you got the green light. They going all the way with you. Okay. All the way with you. Okay. Viz had planned, and I think that's what made them so angry at me, is because I walked, and they lost millions of dollars when I'd done that. Right. And, and the territory kind of was hurt for a long time until okay. Hogan came back. Right. Mm. See? Right. And then Hogan came back and revitalized things. What happens if that night, the night you're supposed to be champion, what if Bob decided to go into business for himself? Can you still take that title from him? Or was Backlund as bad of a 
bad of him MO as we've heard? I, I mean, it's actually a pretty good question. I mean, would you be able to take it from him if Bob didn't want you to take it from him? If I got my hand on him? Okay. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Backlund was very tough, though. Legit tough, though. Well, right? He was very tough. Okay. In a wrestling match, Backlund would beat me. That okay. reason I say, I had a 650 bench. Man. The heaviest man I ever left over my head was 460. Mm. Backlund weighed about 250. Right. To me, that's curling weight. Right. I used to it's look at people. Weight. <laughs> in my younger days, that's how I used to fight. I used to right. look at people as weight. Right. So I figure if I could lift you, I could beat you. Okay. Vince McMahon gave me that idea senior. He said, Tony, if you could press slam him, you could pin him. Mm. That's how come I got to pin Sergeant Slaughter. That's how come I got to pin Huck Hogan. You beat them all, man. You but did. That's what did. Vince Senior told me. He said, everybody you you could press slam, I want you to pin them. And he told him. He said, if Tony gets you up, you let him pin you. Unless Patel at Shea Stadium and he's running away and you don't get the belt. You see, yeah, I but, remember but, this stuff. But, but, but that, that would be, I had the green light. Yeah. He said, yeah. if you could get him up there, Tony, you could pin him. Mm. Right. Right. Backler, or anybody, not just Backler, I, I would have picked him up like this. And I would have threw him. Hey, it's me, the mouth of the sound, Jimmy Hart. Hey, check out my new tag team, baby, Money in the Foul. Hey, Jimmy, don't forget to tell them about Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Well, you know what, I would, but you already did it. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and Pharaoh, the Monty and Pharaoh show. Monty and Pharaoh, bro. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and Pharaoh show. And you're watching the Monty and Pharaoh show. Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. And Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, is it Monty and the Pharaoh? Yeah. Monty and Pharaoh. Dad. The Monty and the Pharaoh. Show the Monty and the Pharaoh to the Monty and the Pharaoh show, yes. and it's Monty and the Pharaoh, baby. Watching Monty and the Pharaoh with Monty and the Pharaoh, Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, what a run! Monty and the Pharaoh, Monty and the Pharaoh. Hey, cut <laughs> music when you want the best in professional wrestling, Long Island. There's only one place you're gonna get it right here, Monty and the Pharaoh. <laughs> now, that's not just the coolest. And that's not just the best. That, my friends, is just incredible. <laughs> Monty and the Pharaoh. You've got the future Hall of Famer, that rocker, Marty Gennetti, MJ in the house, and I'm sitting here with two more future Hall of Famers, Monty and the Pharaoh. We're doing that stuff, and we're going to rock it. The object of wrestling in my day, my day, was turning fantasy into reality. In other words, make the people believe that what you're doing for real. Mr. USA Tony Atlas, we have not seen him since the big event which we worked the gimmick table at the MMP table with superstar, UWF superstar, Mr. Sonny Beach. Ooh. Then Corona hit, yeah, and bam, here we are. Tony, you're looking great. Thank you, my friend. What are you doing to protect yourself against Corona, my friend? Well, like I, uh, I was pretty lucky. I was raised in a generation where the parents was in charge of my diet, not the kids in charge. So if, if all y'all my age or younger, remember your mom always say, eat your veggies. Mm. Where's well, the reason for eating veggies? 50% of the human uh, body should consume, 50% uh, should be fruit and veggies. 30% veggies, 20% fruit. What that do is build one immune system. They have not the coronavirus, but they have virus on this earth 
for many years. In 1918, a virus hit mm -hmm. hit the world and killed 50 million people. One of the reasons why some people catch it and some people don't, it all boils down to your immune system. Mm. See, God gave every animal protection, and we got what's called an immune system, an antibody that 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 fights any any um, cold, flu, or anything that hit us. But but when your immune system falls, then you become more acceptable to diseases. And and most, if you at, look at most people, there people don't eat veggies no more. Well, they tell you to wash your food off before you cook it, right? You take that steak and you stick it underneath the water. Right away, it turned brown. Yeah, <laughs> it's not fresh. It's hard to get fresh meat mm -hmm. because, like, let's say you buy ham. That ham was killed in April in North Carolina, and you got it on your table six months later in Maine. I'm gonna stick to Twinkies. <laughs> this sounds terrible. I don't want to. I I ham from Tony, April. Tony, have you ever eaten a Twinkie in your life? Yeah, yes. you have. Get yes, out, you have. you have? Oh, yeah. A whole box, too, probably, yeah. right? Yeah. I eat there you sweets. Go. You got the munchies. Yeah, but it's a Twinkie, with dude. The like, well, who I eats a Twinkie? What? what? Twink Twink is good as hell. I eat Twinkies. Yeah. Dude, you know how long it takes for a Twinkie to rot? Like, if you put it... Now I'm not going to want Twinkies. It takes, like, 40 years for a Twinkie to, what? like... Not... Is that what they removed during my surgery? <laughs> well, I'll tell, you, hey, I, wow. I'll tell you, when, when I eat a Twinkie, and I blew it out my butt, it felt like it only been there overnight. But it felt like it had been laying around for a hundred years. That's a good thing you didn't have some shock of oh I don't know. We were, we were doing that virtual uh, meet and greet, and I smell a few Twinkies while I, was, oh, yeah. while I was in the room with you. Do you have any thoughts or any uh, kind of inside info about Owen Hart or the, the, the night of his death? The Owen Hart incident and the Bruiser Brody incident to me was similar in this respect. When I came back, after taking Brody to the hospital, when I came back to the dress room, all the wrestlers was laughing and joking like nothing happened. A person died, was murdered right in front of them, and it went unnoticed by the wrestler. All they them wrestlers were thinking about was their match. When Owen Hart fell to his death, the show went on. Mm. Back in the dress room, nobody was talking about the one hot death. All they was talking about was how great their match was. In wrestling, is the strangest, is different than any sport in the world. Boxing probably the closest to it. Because wrestling is an individual sport. You don't have friends in wrestling. You have business associates. Mm. It's a dog, as MacDonald Vachon would say, wrestling it's a dog-eat-dog dog sport, and you have to get your bite out of it. Right. Look at how many wrestlers died over the years, and you hear guys walking around acting like nothing happened. Right. They're not missed by none of the wrestlers. Hmm. The fan missed them. When Piper died, the fan missed Piper, but not the wrestlers. Mm. Piper family missed them, but not the wrestlers. The show must go on. So to these guys, when, when one wrestler is not around, there's more room for them. I don't want nobody out there say, oh, Tony had to say this about my buddy. I didn't say that. What, you Let's didn't say, say that, example, you didn't say it was yeah, Owen yeah. Hart was high? Well, well I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know his condition. I, you know, I wasn't there when Got it you. happened. Gotcha, right. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know his condition. But I said, let's suppose, suppose right. that he were. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if, if you're on cloud nine and you 20 feet in there, something bad going to happen. Yeah. It's like if, if you drink 20 beers and get behind the wheel of your car, something's going to happen. Sometimes things just happen unexpected. I'm very sure that Vince McMahon wished it never happened. I, I'm sure, I agree. I'm, I'm very sure that, 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 that he... But the show was still must go on. Wrestlers are not friends. they business associates. Mm. The first time I... I never knew Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I seen him. I knew of him for 20 years, but never knew him one-on-one -on -one until we did Legend House. Mm. You know, you remember we were saying that. Mm -hmm. Me and Piper never spoke a word the whole time we were in the business until legend. And house. then you gave everybody pig's feet. Nice job, Tony. Yes, yes. So, That's like, rough. all wrestling fans know the historic night when you and Rocky Johnson won the, won the tag belts, right? Right. Many people that watch this show also know that the spot was originally meant for S.D. Jones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had some problems, and mm -hmm. it kind of caused S.D. a spot. But from knowing you... You and SD are pretty close. Can you explain to the fans what kind of man SD Jones was? Underrated. 
in, in a real fight. In a real fight. Okay. SD Jones probably could whoop everybody. I used to go to gym with <laughs> S.D. Jones, and S.D., what was so strange about it, he could incline press more than he could bench press. Wow. Now I don't that's impressive. Do that. That's impressive. He's, he, could, he could take 405 pounds really? and do it 10 times on the incline. Wow. We used to do curls, me and S.D. S.D. used to take 225 pounds and curl it. Mm-hmm. I was squatting 600, SD squatted 600. You were my training partner. Damn. Was SD a true friend? SD was definitely a true friend. So there are friends in wrestling, then? There are friends in wrestling. I'll tell you a story about SD. When Vince first kicked me out of wrestling, I went to, to I, I, I called Vern Gagne out in AWA. He said, yeah, I, I would love to have you in, Tony, but it's going to be a month before I bring you in. So I checked into the Ramada Inn on, on, on 49th and 8th Street. SD told his wife where I was at, his wife Kate, and I talked to her quite frequently. Kate said, tell Tony to come here and stay. I don't want him, he ain't going to have no money left. He paid five, $600 a week at that hotel. Mm. He could come here and stay. Mm. So SD came and started packing my bag. I said, what are you doing? He said, Kate wants you at the house. Kate wants you at the house. We gotta go. Gotta go to the house. Kate gotta go to the house. There it is. <laughs> Kate wants you. Kate wants you. Yeah, that's what, what it has to be. And uh, so he's like, he's like back. So I slept in his um, in his son's room. His name was Jermaine. So they gave me his son's room to sleep in. Well, I didn't just lay around. I mean, I did yard work. I helped Kate around the house. One day, SD came home. He said, "I think I've lost my job." I said, "Why is that, SD?" He said, Vince Jr. told me this. If I don't get Tony Atlas out of my house, he's going to fire me. What? Why? And I said, what you tell uh, uh, Vince? He said, I, he, said, I, he said, Tony, my friend, I can't do that to my friend. Mm. So I said, no, SD, I don't want you to lose your job for me. I said, I go back to the hotel. And uh, uh, luckily for me, SD cousin, they call him Bigfoot. Because he had these, like, size 15 shoe. He was on, like, six four but he had his like a you know size 15 shoot they called him bigfoot so he said hey you only gonna be here for about two more weeks you come and hang out at my place for a couple of weeks you know and i said okay i said i'll pay you he said no just you know just help out with the food he said just pay for your own food he said i can't feed you right he said but it ain't gonna cost me nothing for you to sleep on my couch but i mm -hmm. you know you just buy your own food mm -hmm. so i said cool so i left and sd was able to uh able to uh, uh keep his job you know if you watch the whole thing sd tell our, our our story what happened was i left i walked out on vince and went back to la and uh at the same night the same night that me and me and SD were gonna be uh, win the world title from at that time Fuji and Saito, which would have been incredible. Yeah, and then the idea was to bring the Moon Dogs. They was in Japan at the time. Okay, bring them back. They were gonna feed us for the belt. Okay. Now, to answer your question, then they were gonna have me put me in singers to go against Backler to make me the first black world champion. But I wow. walked out on. That's why. Oh. Wow. That's why I didn't get the belt. Uh, had nothing to do with Vince. Tone. Had, I did that myself. I need one thing answered that's always bothered me, and I want the truth. When Albano hits, I don't know if it was off of seek, over the head with that chair, was that chair gimmick, or did they really take a wood no, chair? They, in the olden days, they didn't gimmick nothing. Wow. That was old school. They wanted the people to hear the sound. See, if you give it, you're not gonna get that crack with oh, we heard break. it. You heard it. Oh, yeah, heard you it. have to. You you want you don't get that with something that's gimmick. Those chairs looked old fashioned too. They look like something you see on right. the Walton set. Those a lot were... of guys, a lot of guys used to do stuff like that back uh, yeah. back back in the day. Like you ever hear of a guy? You know, you get juice. Some guy used a razor blade. Y'all mm -hmm. know that, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. But you ever hear the old term, "do it the hard way"? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gene Ow. Anderson had a, a a way up, and Harley Race could do it too. They could open you up with their fist. Harley could hit you mm. and cut you. Just with their fist. Yeah, Gene Anderson could do that too. He was Ole Anderson, a partner called the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Yeah. Gene yeah. and Ole Anderson. Yeah. They could use their fist and open you up. Now, a lot of guys would use the turnbuckle. There's a screw that sticks out about that far. Mm. And they would hit your head on it and drag your head across it. 
Okay. They call that doing it the hard way. No, you, did, you, that. you and your career didn't take a lot of color, though, right? You, you didn't. Oh, no. We, everybody got color back you, in them days. You had a lot of color? If color back in them days, you would never be a main eventer. Right. Yeah. Because, With... they came, because most of the matches, most of the matches back in them days had color in it. People came to see the blood. If they didn't right. get no, if they had a, if you had a wrestling match in 1975 and nobody bleed, ain't nobody coming back. Right. See what stopped the color was AIDS. Okay. Look at a picture. Okay. Look, look at picture of Bruiser Brody. Every picture he got blood. Look at Dusty Rowe. Every picture got blood. Mm. There's picture okay. of me on the internet with blood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, there's always pictures of wrestling with blood. Interesting. That was okay. that what drew. Where the people saw the blood, and what we used to do, we used to we want the people to see the cuts. We would get right up to a person so they could see the open room. Mm. I remember one time a guy told me, "Oh, that that's ketchup. That's not real." I would pull the band-aids off, smack it, and bleed right on him, right on him. And then they said it's real. Because our our job, we were wrestler. We were not sports entertainer. Mm-hmm. See, the object of wrestling in my day, my day was turning fantasy into reality. In other words, make the people believe that what you're doing for real. Sure. So we were what they call very stiff. Sure. Like none of, the, we didn't pull punches. We laid in punches. We just know where to hit. The guys talked to, uh, I, I hit Gene Anderson one day in the ring. He was one of the guys, him and Gene and Ole helped train me and Larry Sharp. Larry Sharp later started the Monster Factory. Mm -hmm. He also trained Bam Bam Bigelow. But I was I was Larry Sharp's first student. People don't know that. Okay. So I, I, wanted, I hit Gene Anderson with a forearm. Gene said, you f <laughs> you, with them big <laughs> arms you got, is that as hard as you can hit? I want to apologize for my language, but that's how these guys talk. Sure. I'm telling sure. you the way they said it. So I drew back, and I hit him as hard as I could hit him. He said, oh, yeah, that's how you do it. Lay him in, kid. What do you know about that what, the situation? Nancy Argentina the Nancy Argentina. The the girl, my second wife, her name was Lisa. Okay. She was Jimmy Slooker's girlfriend before. She was my girlfriend. I was not in the room when it happened, but the girl that I married to was in the room. What did in she fact, say? In fact, y'all don't know this. Right before Slooker passed away, the the DA of Pennsylvania called me and tried to get a hold of Lisa. Mm. Mm. He tried to get a hold of her because she was an eyewitness to it. See, what happened was, this is what she said. Back in the day, the guy was doing the nose cannon, the cocaine, right? Sure. Slooker did an eight ball that day. That's three and a half grams. He did it that whole day. Hey. So at the end of the night, he ran out by nighttime. He told the girl to go get him some more. She went to get him some more. What Nancy, yeah, it's Nancy to go get more. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay. With Lisa. With Lisa. With Lisa. The guy won't sell him anything because it was after hours. He said, it's took a hitter. Mm. And she failed. I said, what you do? She said, she ran. And she said, that's why I came to you. She said, because I knew that he would not come after me when I'm with you. She said, all I want is my purse. She left her purse in the mm. room. Okay. But she was wondering if anybody, did I hear it about, or anybody know where her purse was at? Mm-hmm. So she told me all this after we had sex. I'm laying in bed with this woman, and she's telling me all this stuff, you know? Wow. I never told anybody. I stayed out of it. Right. I didn't go to the police. I didn't say because I was not a witness. It was always called back in the old days, called that hearsay. Mm-hmm. And I, finally, what happened was what the DA told me, that Slooker wrote a book. And so the guy, he bought the book, the DA that, that prosecuted that case, he bought the book. Because he knew that the case was going to be in it, so he could read to see if his if his name was in it. Mm -hmm. And when he read the story, he never heard that story before. Mm. So he went back and searched the, the court records and found out that they told one story at the trial, and there's another story in the book. That's why they reopened the case. According so, to what Lisa said, he hit her. He, and, he, and I said, I said they hit her hard. He said, she said, you ever seen The Exorcist? Oh, oh yeah. man. With the girl head turned around? Yeah. yeah. That's what he said. He said her head turned right around. Drugs. Yeah. A, a drug could change a person. Especially, especially that cocaine. stuff. Yeah, yeah especially sure. that well, stuff. You start messing with cocaine. Right. I mean, it changed me. I mean, cocaine made me walk out on a world championship. Yeah. Okay? So cocaine can make yeah. you 
Yeah, if you know you get drunk. Did you ever do an eight ball by yourself? I'm impressed no, that somebody no, could dead. do an eight ball by themselves. I could never drink as much. Okay. See, I had a four percent body fat. So I do this. I'm messed up mm. for the whole night. And in the morning <laughs> I got muscle cramps. Oh. That's why I didn't make the show. Oh. See, drugs, if you don't have no body fat, is not to resolve it. So it dehydrated my muscles because I had no body fat. You see? Right. So it dehydrated my muscles. I had serious uh, uh, muscle cramp. And so I had to lay in bed the next day to recuperate. Every time I did drugs, I had to recuperate the next day. I couldn't do drugs and go perform that night. Right. I couldn't do drugs and perform the next day. Yeah. These guys could do it, go in the ring, come back, do it, get up the next morning. They was, it was like their body was immune to it. I was what you call a jock. And the only reason I did it, because I wanted to be one of the boys. I wanted to fit in. See, but that was so my decision to try to fit in. Because I had people like Chief J. Strongboat that told me to stay away from God. S.D. Jones, he said that he said that in the Hall of Fame. I tried to keep Tony away from them guys. There was always guys that tried to get trip you up. Like Mr. Fuji, even if you didn't do drugs, Mr. Fuji would give you a cookie. With LSD in it. Good old Fuji. Uh, Uncle <laughs> Elmo would ask you, to, if you got, you said if your back hurt, he said, hey, brother, I got a, a nice pain pill here for you. He, Uncle Elmo would give you a pill and sit back like this and look at you. You pop that pill and the room started spinning around. Guys would do that as a joke. Mm. Mr. Fuji would pee in a, uh, uh, what you call it, a uh, uh, shampoo bottle. You know that, that Johnson shampoo that was kind of brown, the brown? Yeah. He would fill half of it with urine, and he would go around and anybody want to use shampoo? Good shampoo. Want to use shampoo? Good shampoo. <laughs> Fuji fed a guy roadkill one time as a joke. Oh, no. That's Took just... a dead dog off oh, the road, took it home now. and cooked it, and, and invited the rest over and fed yeah, it Fuji, to him. Fuji, Fuji was insane. evil, dude. Yeah. Yo. Johnny Valentin, Johnny Valentin, one time a guy was dressed, <laughs> I can't remember his name, he had asthma. Took the asthma stuff out, put lighter fuel in. The guy took. <laughs> These guys did this for real. Ronnie Garman would come up behind you. We driving down the highway. Ronnie Garman come behind you, put his front bumper against your back bumper, and start pushing you down the highway at 80 miles per hour. <laughs> to these guys, this was a real. They used to take guys out there, a mother gun and all them guys at Flair in Norfolk, they were hanging away with the KKK. Mm. They would get a black guy, they had a chair. They had floats on the side of it. And they would dope the guy, strap him to the chair, put him in the water in Norfolk, Virginia, and then put blood, chicken blood, in the water to draw the shark. What? And every time the shark come to bite the guy, they pull on the rope. What? <laughs> Your close friends are Mark Henry, I'm assuming, right? Oh, okay. okay. Um, he made a statement about uh, about Leo Rush. Hey, Henry said Leo Rush got released because he didn't work hard enough. Uh, Leo Rush was also known. He's one of the guys that refused to carry the bags for the veterans also. He was afraid to do what now? Uh, you know, because you had told me when you were going through the industry, right? You would carry Dick Murdoch's bag. We were just yeah, talking about right. that today. Yeah, Leo that, Rush yeah. refused. To, he felt it was degrading um, to carry bags. This is what I told Mark Henry. <clears throat> I say, Mark, you are the first, the first black wrestler to work for the WWF or WWE that didn't fuck up. Interesting. Period. You were the first. He stuck in there. He hung in there. He made a good name for himself. Mm -hmm. He entertained the fans. He did what he was told to do. Mm -hmm. See, Mark understood that he got an opportunity to make life good for his family. He understand that it's a business. Wrestling is entertainment like a movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of guys with this degrading stuff, I think it would be more degraded for Mark Henry. All the guys that thought like, uh, what's that guy's name? Leo Rush. Leo Rush mm -hmm. never made it. No. People don't want to, they don't want that type of attitude. Mm -hmm. Mark Henry got the best attitude of any wrestler in the WWE. See? Is Mark Henry underrated in Vince your mind? Vince took this, yes. Thank Vince, you. Vince, but you see, Mark Henry paid for us. 
Mark Henry made Vince trust black athletes again. See, Vince Sr. <coughs> loved Ernie the Cat Lad. Oh. Loved him. Yeah. In fact, Ernie, by the, Vince Sr. came to me and said, the reason that we booked you, Tony, because you was recommended by my best friend, uh, Ernie the Cat Lad. Ernie Lad. He said, I don't care what people tell you. He said, if it wasn't for Ernie Lad, you would not be here. They had the utmost respect for Ernie the Cat Lad, who was a black man. Mm -hmm. I screwed up. Rocket screwed up. Yeah. JYD, he would have did, would have been as big as Hogan or anybody. But as, as all you know, he double screwed up. He did his job, but he got involved with mm -hmm. the drugs that messed his career up. Sure. Every black person that ever been in this business, people ask me one time, say, Tony, was there much racism in the business? I said, every black person I knew was a main eventer. They got a business to run. That's what this kid don't understand. Mark Henry is a businessman. Mark Henry and Lauren, the checks were coming. And they never did nothing to hurt Mark. What did they do to, to hurt him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Thoughts on Ahmed Johnson while we're on bad attitudes behind the scenes. Any any thoughts That's, on... Well, see, there, there you go. See, some people feel that the world owes them something. Okay. And unfortunately for a lot of my people, they think they owe them something for slavery. Right. Mm -hmm. All like, right. I saw the shirt that he was complaining about. Mm -hmm. I don't see what he see. Interesting. He said it was racist. I I, I, I look at it. I, I, I don't see what is racist about it. I mean, somebody going to make a shirt of you. Look at the booty -o. You know, funny looking, yeah. fat album looking guy. Yeah. When you were doing the blow and you blew it, and they were going to make you world champion, were they going to turn you heel against Bob Backlund? No. Wait a minute. Was Bob going to be turned to heel? Someone yeah. had to... Bob Backlund was going to be a okay, heel. Me and Backlund had one match. It was in Baltimore, Maryland, and I won. Really? Okay. Long title match. Uh, uh, you pinned him? You pinned him? No, no. What happened? <laughs> I leaped from him. <laughs> I, I leaped from him, and Backlund raised up, and his head hit me in the crotch, and and they and they DQ Backlund and raised my hand. Wow. Interesting. And we wow. Still come back for the rematch after we dropped the title, but it was already working towards that. Wow. And Lou Albano said, Tony, if you don't mess up. Freddie Blassett and Lou Albano say, if you don't mess up, he said, you got the green light. They're going all the way with you. Okay. All the way with you. Okay. This had planned, and I think that's what made them so angry at me, is because I walked, and they lost millions of dollars when I'd done that. Right. And, and the territory kind of was hurt for a long time until okay. Hogan came back. Right. Mm. See? Right. And then Hogan came back and revitalized things. What happens if that night, the night you're supposed to be champion, what if Bob decided to go into business for himself? Can you still take that title from him? It was back on as bad of an bad of an MO as we've heard. I, I mean, it's actually a pretty good question. I mean, would you be able to take it from him if Bob didn't want you to take it from him? If I got my hand on him. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Backlund was very tough, though, legit tough, though, well, right? Well, he was very tough. Okay. In a wrestling match, Backlund would beat me. That okay. reason I say, I had a 650 bench. Man. The heaviest man I ever left over my head was 460. Mm. Backlund weighed about wow. 250. Right. To me, that's curling weight. Right. I used to it's look at people. Weight. <laughs> in my younger days, that's how I used to fight. I used to look right. at people as weight. Right. So I figure if I could lift you, I could beat you. Okay. Vince McMahon gave me that idea senior. He said, Tony, if you could press slam him, you could pin him. Mm. That's how come I got to pin Sergeant Slaughter. That's how come I got to pin Huck Hogan. You beat them all, man. You did. But that's you what did. Vince Senior told me. He said, everybody you you could press slam, I want you to pin him. And he told him. He said, if Tony gets you up, you let him pin you. Unless Patel at Shea Stadium and he's running away and you don't get the belt. You see, yeah, I but, remember but, this stuff. But, but, but that, that would be, I had the green light. Yeah. He said, yeah. if you could get him up there, Tony, you could pin him. Mm. Right. Right. Backler, or anybody, not just Backler, I, I would have picked him up like this. And I would have threw him six feet into the audience.
you know, who we consider um, one of the greats of all time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the one uh, humbling thing about doing the show is you get to meet some of these ladies and gentlemen. Uh huh. And the majority of them turn out to be such wonderful, wonderful human beings. Can I get this in real fast? Yes. This, this show was 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 created out of the love the true love for pro wrestling mm. from two guys who grew up and have known each other for over 40 years junior high we genuinely loved it we used to practice it in the backyard and i can say with confidence that some of these guys who got supposed real training you never would have survived what we did to each other on the hard ground in the winter time in new york back in the day but this show was based on the love of people like the man who's sitting to our right. Well, this I, was everything that we wanted in, in, to have in mind for for these kinds of wrestlers. I also, I mean, I we, will, we are blessed. I also want to say, Faro, it's very, it's very humbling to have oh, yeah. people watching this show. Oh my God! Yeah. Like the Maria Davises, oh, or like God. the Todd B. Crafts, oh, right? Oh my God! That show the respect, and they tune in every week. Yeah. And you know what? How many times do I say how funny they are and they make me laugh? <laughs> Our audience but anyway, is hilarious. this whole thing has been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. But unfortunately, Unf and I'm going to make this. Why clear. does there always have to be an unfortunately? <laughs> so before I even go to uh, <laughs> here we go. Before we even go to this, I, I want <sighs> everybody to understand that we will question Mr. Atlas. Okay, he uh, will answer. Oh. Yes, we will take a commercial break, and then. All the fans out there, ask whatever you want to Mr. <laughs> Atlas. He will not deny you the awesome. opportunity to challenge him on anything. All right. But allow us to ask these questions. And everybody, there will be other wrestling talk. But first, sure, sure, Tony, in life, you want it to be pleasurable to the best of your ability. But then sometimes it's this rat. It just gnaws <laughs> at you and nibbles on you, right? <laughs> and you're sitting on the floor it's just... <laughs> is it on your toe? It's like like like, like nicking your at you. Big toe? And you know you know, he says things oh. and no like flies, you know, you keep swallowing. <laughs> like, like, no, in a portal potty? A fly in a portal potty. potty. This is a, a fly this, this is a rat. I know what you're talking this about. This is a rat. Yeah. You know why it's a rat? <laughs> because it's rats so steal. Ooh. Right? Ooh. Rats take. Ooh. They 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 go behind your back. They do all this really, really, really stuff. And rat. Again, people don't know me per se but like we've been invited to come to someone's studio sure come the dude doesn't want to meet me in person no it'll be ugly yeah good lord i am an exterminator but that's not the point <laughs> holy raid can batman tony next <laughs> you started up with boston wrestling okay very entertaining show because of you thank you absolutely how does it start with mr dan marotti well I was home one day, and Dan gave me a phone call. And before I say this, I want all the fans to do to do one thing for me. I want them not like I say. I'm, I'm I don't know all about this technology stuff. I want the fan to get me on the Steve Warko show. You know what Steve does, right? Shoot, yes. Steve put you on that live detect machine. Now the guy that Steve got to do his live detect, he's the best in the world. Okay. He worked for the FBI. He did all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Live detector machine. Right. You know, cause I could say one thing today, somebody up. I don't have power on the internet. I, I'm silenced. I, I can't talk to people on the internet on the, my Facebook. The only time I could talk or or, or, or defend myself. It, when nice people like you come along. So I want to be on the Steve Walker show. So contact Marty and the Farrell to get Tony Atlas on Steve Walker show to for everything that I'm going to tell y'all now, I want to do it on a live detector machine. That way we know who's lying and who's not lying. This is how it started. Dan called me one day, told him about the program he's trying to put together. He said, what would it cost to get you down here? And I said, Dan, I try to, I'm going to try to give you the best deal I possible. I said, I work for Steve Picard. It was uh, Top Rope Wrestling. Okay. I said, I charge you the same as I charge him. He said, what did he pay you? I said, give me 450 He go, uh, what can you do it for 200 I said, <laughs> I said no, I, I, can't, I can't do it for 200 He said, yeah, but he said, but 
this is the, the beginning of things. Things will get big and we're going to do good and give me a whole bunch of, of stuff. My wife is sitting there going <laughs> the whole time. The whole time she's going, don't do that. Okay. So, Fred, I said, Dad, can you at least give me 300 Well, I, I, I know I could do the 200 And uh, my wife going, me being Tony, not, not too smart, I took the deal. But I said, look, I could do it when I got something, when I'm coming through your area. And I got people like MAJ could tell you the same thing. Okay. Uh, 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 Johnny, I'm going to mess up his name. I call him uh, Callahan, but then the other day he told me it's not Callahan, it's Callahurst. Okay. Now, John, Johnny helped me out a lot. Him and his wife, Mary, are wonderful people. So y'all want any million billions or autograph picture or anything in fact i'm going to drop by on the 27th of this month just to say hi to him he just told me i set up something for you to make some money i said johnny you don't have to do that he said no i want to do it for you try to johnny you don't have to do that you ask johnny i tell you the same thing johnny callahan i love him I, I had a little i got drunk one day and hollered at his wife and <laughs> she got mad at me <laughs> <laughs> that's a surprise <laughs> <laughs> but Mary, Johnny, if Mary listens, Mary, I'm sorry that I pulled the ox baker on you, Oops. and I, it won't happen again. If I holler at you again, Mary, slap me. Just, that what my wife do, Monica. We just backhand me when I when I get too <laughs> rambunctious with her. But I was drunk at the skirt and holler and hurt her feeling. And I felt bad about that, so I want to take this time to to say I'm sorry to Mary. There you go. There and you go. and I'm going to go by there the 27 to apologize to Mary and okay. to shake Johnny's hand and thank him for everything he ever did for me. He's a great, great, Excellent. great person. Excellent. John John Callahurst of MAJ Collector Talk Game and Collector. But anyway, back to the story. You know how I do. I get all off into everything. <laughs> Come back, but anyway, Tony. Come back. Come back, Tony. Yeah. Anyway, if I had a show, like I live in Maine. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm driving to New York, that's a 360-mile trip. Wow. So I said, well... I got expenses. I got the rental car. I got gas. I got tow. People that travel. I got food. So if somebody offered me five hundred dollars in my head right off the bat, I estimate how how much it's gonna cost me to get there. Sure. So if it's gonna cost me uh, two hundred dollars to get there, somebody give me three five hundred, then I know I'm gonna make it three hundred. To me, automatic. That's a three, that's not five hundred to me. That's three hundred because it'll cost me two hundred to get there. So I said, I had to figure out a way of making my expense money. Mm -hmm. So I, I called Dan. I said, yeah, Dan, we could do it when I'm coming through your area. Right. But I don't know what happened. He wanted me to come down there when I didn't have nothing. Well, me being me, I did it a couple of times. Which, which the, to defend, she was Roddy. Okay. That now, was your here, decision. You accepted that. I accepted that. That's right. I, I made that decision. I accepted it. But then it got to the point, uh, the prices started going up. And uh, I remember one trip, and I told Dan this. I told him many a times, I, every time he paid me, I, I, I talked to him about it. He just smiled and walked away like I was a piece of shit. And uh, I told him, I said, Dan, you know, it's cost me a lot more to do your show without something to go with it. So then one time I had to go to Pennsylvania. No, Atlanta City, New Jersey from uh, Mike Hamilton. He runs the the, uh, the showboat in uh, in, in uh, uh, New Jersey, uh, Atlanta City in New Jersey. Okay. It's a, for me, it's a six and a half to seven hour drive. Mm. So I said, well, I go down, I do Boston wrestling. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I stay in Boston. Cause that would take two hours. Cause it's a two-hour drive from me to to Melrose. It take me two hours of driving. So I said the next day I just got five hours to do. So I said, Dad, I come down and I'll do your show. Can you get me a hotel room? Oh sure, Tony. We get your hotel room. So I drive down. He get the hotel room for me. I went to get my two hundred dollars. He gave me flip. Uh, what was it? Fifty-five dollars. And I said. Uh, what is this for? He said, it's the rest of your pay. He said, I had to deduct the room for your, uh, I took the pay, the, you know, out of the room. So I, you know, I said, oh, forget about it. I'm on the way to Atlanta City. The guy in Atlanta City is going to pay me 1200 bucks. Plus, I sell all the gimmicks I want. So I'm looking at, you know, 
about a fifteen hundred. But you had just away. lost almost three quarters of your intended pay. Right. So so I'm left with fifty bucks. But now, I got a whole. And how many hours what? do you shoot? How many hours I do you shoot? Dad, with Boston we started wrestling? shooting at three o'clock during the day, and we be finished at nine o'clock. So it's about six hours of, of taping. So six you hours. had to drive for hours. To do six hours of taping and pay for your own room and get fifty bucks, basically yes. fifty-five dollars. And this is honest, God, true. Wow! I say, I How generous! I'm a, wow! If I could get on Steve Workle, I'm gonna tell the same thing. My mother told me one thing. She said, when you tell a lie, you have to tell another lie to cover that one up. Sure. Another lie to tell that. Sure. One. And by the time you get through at the end, you don't know what lie you told. Yeah. But when you tell the truth, it comes out the same. Every time, of course. Right? Every time. Anyway, I, let, I got more Go story. Ahead. Go ahead. Another Hit time, uh, I went down for Dan, and I'm trying to help Dan. This was for him, because mm -hmm. I was running late. Because see, what I used to do, I work at a gym in the morning as a personal trainer. I go to the gym at six in the morning to train people. I train people from six in the morning until twelve o'clock. On the days I had to work for Boston Rassett. I get off work at 12 o'clock. Go get the rental car. Go get the rental car. Okay. At, without stopping. And I'm, I'm, I'm up at at 4 in the morning now. Well, so I've course. been up since 4. Because sure. i got to have breakfast every day. Sure. I'm at the gym from 6 until 12. Then I will go straight to the rental car place. Get a rental car and drive to Melrose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... I'm starving. I ain't eating up this say four o'clock in the morning. And you've had a full day before noon. Exactly. Quite honestly, you know, I don't put in all them hours. So right. I called Dan one day, and I said, Dan, to save you some time, so that we could get started earlier. Because you say you got a lot of things to do, so we could start early. I said, can you get one of them kids that you that work with you to go get me some chicken wings? He said, sure. So I get there. They have my chicken wing. You all, you remember I just sat there eating the chicken wing? The reason I ain't ate them chicken wings that people don't know, I ain't ate all day. And there was no time between, from, from 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm running. I'm running. I work a regular job. You know, I'm not rich. I'm, I'm a very poor man. So when I get there, Dan go to pay me. He give me 180 bucks. I said, Dan, you cut me 20 bucks. He said, well, I had to pay for them chicken wings. I didn't say nothing. I'm driving home. My wife is telling me, don't go there no more. He's taking advantage of it. My wife kept telling me that. She kept telling me. As a good wife would say. By the way, say. my wife is in the hospital now with a stroke. By the way, oh, I want to ask boy. you, how is Monica Sorry. doing? I talked to her about at, right before you came to pick me up. She's yeah. all happy. She worried about me being in a car accident or something or something happened to me. She always worried about me. She loved me to death, and I love her the, the same way. She's the greatest woman in the world. So I get home that day. Then the virus hit. Mm. You know, there's other stories to go with that, but I'm just trying to make but everything I, I just, brief. I want to make something clear. Here. I, I, we're we're going to get through the whole story. But your wife's ill. Yes. Everybody knows this. Yes. Now, let me ask you, you know, when you work with someone for a while, do you, do you think you build a friendship with that person? You would think so. Okay, but w at this point, you're working with Marathi. Do you w Did you consider him a friend? Yes. So, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. How can how? Wait a second. He knows your wife is sick, and this is how he treats you. I yeah. just want to make sure I'm getting this clear before I completely fucking explode. But are you serious? Well, I'm the type of guy. I mean, what is that though? He's I, if he's your friend, then why is why would he possibly do it something a, like that? It, it was a way I was raised. I would go <laughs> work for a guy. See, I was raised in the country. And, See, y'all city slickers. I'm an old country boy from the hills of Virginia. We're city slickers? Wow. I would go, I would go haul hay for a guy all day long. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, he gave me four dozen of eggs. Right. It was called horse trading right. in yeah. the older days. Sure. Right. So I'm used to doing a lot of work and getting right. a little bit back. I think you're right, I, I'm, Tone. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, because, not hauling, yeah. I'm not hauling hay. So I think I am way, a city slicker. That, Thanks a lot. Where, go on. Well, it's the way I, I was raised. Of course. I, I got this way as long as I... Conduct bill, you tell me you have to take the big ones with the little ones. Sure. And sure. Uh, I, I just overlook things. I, I just let it go. I, I don't let it interfere with my happiness. 
I like I like to be happy. Tony, it sounds you like know, you trust people. When you stop That's and think about it, comes down when to, you stop you, and think about it, I started in the seventies. Right. How many wrestlers that still acted today? Not many. that started in the seventies. Right. Not many. So I I feel fortunate. I'm you know, I feel proud to be an American. I just feel proud when I get something. Sometimes it's, you know what I get makes me happy. Sometimes what I get it never makes me sad. I never sad. I just get what's called disappointed. Mm -hmm. So when the virus hit, uh, uh, the studio closed in Boston. Mm. The studio closed. Mm -hmm. So Dan couldn't tape. So he asked me, he said, can we come to your house and tape? So he's going to drive from Melrose up to Maine. He's like, hey, keep Boston wrestling. Keep the wrestlers working, right? Keep them working. Yeah, that's what he said. Gotta keep them all working. Keep working. So he drove up to Maine to meet me at my house. I said to myself, I said, boy, that's great. I said, for the first time, when did I first start with them? For the first time, I don't know what when I started with Boston Rise, but okay. I said, for the first time in my life, mm. Dan going to pay me what he promised because I got no expenses. Okay. This was going to be the first time. The right. first time. There's, there's no gas. There's no hotel. There's Nothing. no food. I'm right. going to get $200. Right. Yeah. For Dad, he got to give me $200. He got I don't him. have to pay for no rental car. I don't have to pay for no food. Him. I got, got no him. expense. I can sit home and make my $200. This is a slam dunk. I was happy as a hog in slop. Right. Then he paid Going me. around. Then he paid me uh -oh. 100 bucks. Wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. I said, whoa. What? I thought it was what? 200 I thought, I thought it was $200. For the taping. Did he charge you for his gas to get there? I don't. He I, took $100 what? out. And I asked him. I, I asked know. him. Dan, no, I'm telling the truth. He know damn well. I don't care what he tell them Boston wrestling fans. Right. He know, I'm, he know right. damn well I'm telling the freaking truth. And at this point. I have, <laughs> hey, I have no reason to lie. I'm right. an old man. Tony, I, I want to reiterate. To I want to reiterate during I'm this time. I'm telling the damn truth. I, I did I want to reiterate, myself. at this go. time, go, Monica is still in the hospital. My wife is in the hospital. She's in the hospital, Interesting. suffering with a stroke. But you know what? I'm going to defend Dan here. I'm going to defend Dan. Why? I, I'm sorry, Tony. I'm going to have to. Why? All right, the guy's fine, using his website, and he's selling your artwork. Yeah, but him. he promised me $200. Ah. Okay, but... He I... promised... Hey, a man is only as good, good as, as his word. word, what my mother taught me. Imagine well, that. Now, now, let me finish. Imagine story, that. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, let go, me finish. Tom. So, go. so... He gives me a hundred dollars instead of the two hundred. I can't believe this guy. Okay, but being Tony, I said, "Well, at least I made a hundred. And this time he paid for my meal Tone. and the Corona beer that I was drinking. Tone. So I said, "Well, at least I got a free meal out of him <laughs> and, a, and a beer and a beer. and a Corona beer and a beer for six hours. That's yeah. That's, it cost wow. hundred dollars. Chicken cost, wings and a beer, six hours. Six good, hours. Good pay. That's great. Good, good, good. So finally, uh." <laughs> The studio opened back up. Mm. The mm. studio opened back up. Okay. So I drove down. I couldn't get my deal with the rental car no more. Rental car went up. So the rental car was a hundred and twenty dollars for the right. rental car. Right. When I add up my expenses, now he's supposed to pay me two hundred. Sure. My expense was two hundred seventy-five dollars. Oh, great! Nothing like losing money. So now I'm That's... paying out of my pocket. <laughs> I'm spending what? money. With my wife in the house, brother. Mm -hmm. Great. No work. Great. Broke living on Social Security. I'm a senior citizen. Sure, so I live sure. off of Social Security. Mm -hmm. So then, now I spend it 75. I'm paying to you're work. Paying. To be on his program. I'm you're, paying. You're paying. So I said, Dan, wow. I can't keep doing it. He said, well, I can get you some, some more money. I said, well, how are you going to do that? So he started soliciting me to do artwork for him. So Dan, he's going to make it up to you. I'm going to get you artwork. So right, get me the artwork. I but gotcha. what you don't understand, That's I, got, I still got to do the work. Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, it ain't like I got a machine to run off artwork. Right. Of it course. takes me a week to do one of them artwork. Well, of course. It's a week. That's your time. So table. I work all week. Mm -hmm. Dad charged them 175 I get 100 Wait a minute. Hold on. What? This is my first time hearing that. You charge 175 Right. And Dan. Give me 100 Percentage wise. It takes almost. It's almost. The, 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 it's getting close to half. It's 
Well, if he takes Dan takes seventy five, you charge. He's getting a hundred. He's getting. He's, he's right, taking. Right. Yeah, he's taking so four, close to so half. Dan's reasonably taking close. Forty percent for what? For book for getting him to work. Oh, so he's getting you to work. Right. So it's a forty percent. Right. And so mark. when I come down, it's it, instead of giving me. Uh, if I do two artwork, it said give me two hundred, give me four hundred. If I do one artwork, he give me three hundred. He give me that the hundred. He said, "See, I told you I make you more money." I said, "That's okay." Then one Christmas, he come around with this paper. He want me to sign the the letters. Mm. I said, "What the letters for?" He said, "Always oh, it help you and wrestle to make some money." He started soliciting money, had people to send him money to help me to pay my rent. To pay your rent? Yeah, that like to pay my mortgage. Oh, okay. I never saw a penny of it. What? What? Yeah, he would use me to solicit money from people, that, and he pocketed the you, money. Do you have any idea how much he accumulated? No. That's, One guy told you know me. What the, wait, a, you know what that is? The, there was a buddy of man uh, that, that told me at a convention. He said, hey, Tony, uh, I, I see you having problems with Dan trying to help you to get around. He said, you got 400 or some dollars, you know, in the, you know, Hey, I donated to you, brother. I'm, I'm here to help you. Your wife's in the hospital, bro. Yeah. I, I donated to Boston bro, Wrestling said, four hundred dollars. I've never seen none of that money. You know, where you didn't see what? anything. Not a not a freaking penny. So finally, wow. I was talking to some people when you know when the Corona hit, everything got canceled. Mm -hmm. So a buddy of man named Larry Huntley, he said, Tony, you should get on Facebook. Okay. He said you could set home if you need to make for what this guy pay you. You could make more money mm -hmm. sitting home. That's right. So one day I, I kept brushing him off, brushing him off, brushing him off. Finally, I said, okay, let's do it. So I went out, bought me a little laptop, you know, went to Verizon, you know, got my sure. Facebook account and everything. Mm -hmm. And me and old Larry Huntley, he runs wrestling. In fact, I'm wrestling for Larry Huntley at the Skahegan Fair. Okay. And Larry started helping me. And he drove, he drive 50 miles. He lived 50 miles from me. But because me and Larry been friends from, all oh, no, back since the nannies, you know, he drives up. And I tried to give him money for gas. He wouldn't take it. So what I do, I would buy him food and do what right. I can to help Larry right. and everything. And uh, so we did a virtual sale. I did one virtual sale. Hell, I made 700 bucks. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. I gave Larry. I gave Larry a hundred dollars. Maybe there's something me. to this Facebook. Yep. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I gave Larry. I gave Larry a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and the three people, the two people he brought with me, I gave everybody a hundred bucks. Okay. I made four hundred dollars. I didn't even have to leave my room. Took me one hour to do it. Wow. I said, "Shit." Yeah. Huh? Going to Boston Wrestling, I make freaking a hundred bucks if I'm lucky, and I got a and it's a ten hour day. See, it's two hours driving. Mm hmm. Six hours of taping, of course, and a two-hour drive back. Nice. So the day Great. for me, the day went from one to eleven. Right. I leave my house at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. I get home at eleven o'clock. Right. Sometime eleven thirty, depending on the traffic. Gotcha. It was a full, you know, it's eleven hour, ten, eleven hour day for me. Mm -hmm. So I said, I did it on on uh, January, January the fifteenth. I'm sitting there, I'm eating my chicken wing. Dan is doing a virtual now. He, now he don't start doing virtual selling with my artwork and stuff. So I'm sitting there eating. I said, Dan, I'm getting me a computer. Yeah. Dan, I'm get. you can watch this tape. If he got that tape, you can see it on tape. He got this tape. He's doing a virtual. I said, Dan, I'm getting my computer. I'm, I don't want to sell on your virtual. I'm going to be doing my own virtual. It Norman. So then he called for uh, the thing. I said, I'm not working for you no more. Mm. And that's what happened. Okay. Now I hear from people. I hear from people. He, well, Dan been texting me and emailing me. I mean, not email, but been texting me. I gave Marty one of them. I've been deleting them. So, Tony, I want to I wanna alert the fans out there. So when this went on, you and me, you and I, we spoke on the phone. Hey, what's up? You told me the story. I said, good for you. Do you, do you, end your relationship with him. Just do you. Take care of yourself. Absolutely. And that's what you did. Yeah, that's right. So J12 okay. says out there, what's the end game for us? For us? So, hold on. Okay. 
the end game? So this is not a game. When Go you on. said, "Hey, yeah, cool, I'm just doing me," and you disappeared, you didn't bother with the guy, and he kept texting you. I left him alone. And then I didn't really know much about Boston wrestling, and right. then all of a sudden I'd hear this guy talking trash about you. Now I didn't like it, so we asked you to come on. Remember, you called in, mm -hmm. and you were nothing but a professional. You mm -hmm. didn't bad mouth him, even though he claims we tried to bait him in. To I, have no, I have no, I have no option. You didn't say a word. I don't want to work for yada, him no yada, more. Yada. That's it. So I don't want to do with him. That's you. it. Uh, again, right. This continues on. Simple. And then recently, something happened with Marty Gennetti. Right. And then you alerted to me other videos with Kamala talking about why right. he's done this. Sure. And I said, you know what? I'm not going. So I'm going to go back. I'm not going to sit here. I consider Gennetti a friend. Sure. I consider Mr. Atlas a friend. Of course. I'm not going to let this shit go on anymore. I will use this program to stop this nonsense he could have just left you alone and that's, there's, that's and there's nothing would have gone he won't on do it but he I said mean, he still talks about you seven months brother seven months every other day i get a threat you know what he's threatening to do with me now take a guess what's he threatening to do? he want to report me to the irs so they stopped so he could uh, uh take uh, uh, so they stopped sending he want to take away my social security check because he's mad that he can't underpay also, you and I'm overwork only, the you? Only, the only income I got is my Social Security check. And because I want work for Dan Morella, he want to... I, I, I showed him. Because I knew y'all going to... they going to call me... Dan going to call me a liar. I knew that because he'd done that before. He called you a thief on the, last, on the last video I saw with Cena Senior. Just yeah, two days well, ago. I knew... Three I knew, days ago. Whatever I, the fuck it was. I knew from before when people asked me why did I stop and I told them the truth. Dad went on and called me a liar. He made fun of me. He said stuff like, now who would work for 50 bucks? That even that was put like pouring salt in the room because I done that. You did right. it. I right. did it. Right. Now I'm really feeling it's like so a, outrageous. Now I'm, feel, right. I'm really feeling like a fucking idiot. This guy fucked me up the ass and don't don't even give me a kiss. And then and then and then he gonna I, I hope I didn't say nothing wrong. Absolutely not. No. And then I said, enough is enough. I don't want nothing to do with him. I don't want nothing to do with him. Well, how does it how does it make you feel now, when you're on that show? He's going out to my look. If I'm such a horrible person, if I'm so horrible, if I'm stealing from you, if I'm lying about you, why in the f in hell are you playing my tapes? When Vince McMahon get rid of somebody, he don't keep showing their matches. Why is I'm on Boston freaking wrestling? Why? Why are you showing my tapes? Why are you selling my tapes if I'm such a horrible piece of crap? I wouldn't sell the tape of no horrible piece of crap. I wouldn't sell the tapes of a, of, of a liar. I wouldn't sell the tapes of a thief. Now I'm a thief. Now he's going out to my freaking Social Security. Ain't going That's all shit. I got left. Damn, what do you shit. want me to do? You want my freaking Social Security check? You want my Social Security check now? <laughs> what? Are you gonna take my social security from me? I want sick this fucking year for that social security check. Are you gonna take it and all them black man people that support you for my social security check? Why? You never took a fucking bump in your life. You never did nothing for this business except for sucking like a fucking leech. I tried to ignore you, man. I left you alone. Why you can't leave me alone? What you want me to do? Come down there and beat your crooked ass into Bolivia? You cannot whoop my ass, boy. I would beat the living dog shit out of you. Tony, take a break. We're going to take a commercial break. Go, yeah. We're taking a commercial break.
finest hour. Good times surely will come. All I know is people talk without listening. Well, I'm saying this life's too short to live in these extremes. Have we seen our finest hour? Good times surely will come. Say fake news. Mm. Boston wrestling is fake news. Hi, this is WWE Hall of Famer Tony Atlas, and I, I, this is my first time doing this. I feel real good about it. Uh, I got a helper here, uh, Larry Hunter, and then I got Monty on the other line, and when I run in trouble, he would help me. Like I said, this is my first time. You can see I'm at my hall. I got my favorite girl, Chana, right here beside me. Got me press slamming somebody, a little action figure. So we're going to start this off. Now, in school, one of the things that I would really, really like to do is because of uh, I live in America, and I'm very proud of being in America, and I miss the USA. So I'm going to start off like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless the USA. Now, a lot of people uh, over the years, I'm sure y'all hear a lot of stuff about wrestlers. But I was just talking to Larry and Marty the other day. I said, you know, I read some stuff on the paper about guys that I travel with, like Ric Flair and Wahoo McDaniel, Carlite Bill. And I never knew much about them until I went to Wikilink and found out uh, stuff about them. But I don't want y'all to go to Wikilink to find out about me. Now, I was born in a little small town called Clifton Ford, Virginia. And uh, I don't remember much about my childhood in Clifton Ford, but I do remember that I grew up in a town called Lowmore, Virginia. Now, Lowmore was a small town between Covington and Clifton Ford. It was uh, eight miles from Covington, and it was uh, four, mi four miles from Clifton Ford. We live in a little, what do you call it, in the old days, you call them like a, a slave shack. I mean, it had dirt floors. Uh, you have wooden walls, and in the winter time, we we didn't get much snow up in the uh, up up in the hill. Uh, they called the Allegheny Mountains. You got the Allegheny uh, Mountains, and you got uh, 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 you got the Blue Ridge Mountains, and uh, it was all mountain region. I mean, right on the the, the border of uh, if you looked up on your map, look at Lomo, it's right on the border of uh, Virginia and West Virginia. So this is kind of like northern. Uh, uh, Northwest Virginia, where I raised up at, where life in uh, at that time in the fifties and in the sixties was hard for everybody. I mean, I used to wake up at nighttime uh, whenever it snowed and shake snow off my blanket because the snow would come through the cracks of, of the house. We didn't have running water, so what you had to do, you had to lower a bucket down in the well. The well was set out in the front of the yard, and you draw that water in, and that was the water you used to wash with and to drink with. Now, my mother had nine kids, so you have what's called a foot tub. So you take that water, you heat it up, heat it up on the stove, uh, you heat that water, that's, I, I, this is my neighborhood, you heat that water up on the stove, you dump it in, and you take a bath. Well, every, every one of my brothers always want to be the first <laughs> the first in that bath water. You can understand why. Because with nine kids, by the time you got to that nine kid, you were taking a mud bath. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're the first kid, then the only way you get fresh water, you got to draw more water, set it on the stove, heat it up, and pour it into this foot stuff. Now, 
do not all you guys when you want to use the restroom or something, you just get up and just walk through the house or walk, you know, down the hall and use the restroom. We didn't have that. We have what we call an outhouse. Now the outhouse was a set on the outside away from your house. So you wanted away from your house and, and you use the house out, uh, but at nighttime or in the winter time, they had a slop bucket, as we call it, that, that was underneath the bed. And you take that slop bucket and you set on that bucket. You do what you got to do. In the morning, you got to go dump that bucket. That's how you, we used the bathroom when I was a kid. Now, <laughs> one day, <clears throat> uh, we used to play jokes on each other, too. I got to tell you the jokes we used to play. My brother would go like and kill a snake, you know, and I'm sitting in the outhouse, you know, looking around. You got to look for snakes when you live in Virginia. You know, you, you have water marks on, you have copperheads, you have snakes that would bite you and kill you. You know, there were a lot of poisonous snakes down uh, down south, you know. So my brother, them, they, they, they used to light, uh, uh, set something on fire and and stick it underneath the, the, the outhouse and smoke would come in the outhouse. And he, they, would, they would lock the door from the outside where I came at. And they'd holler, fire, fire. And I'm banging on the door. I'm trying to get out. You know, and, and, you know, with my pipes halfway down to my knees. That was another joke. Sometimes they would catch a snake and they would kill it. And they would throw it in there and shut the door on me real fast. Ah, jump up there. So, but we had fun teasing, <laughs> teasing each other. Thing. Well, one time I did something that was not a joke. It was an accident. I got up. I had to go to the restroom real bad, real bad. So I got up and um, I picked over that slop jar, jar and everything that was in it from all the kids, my grandmother, my mom just went everywhere. It was all over the floor. You know, so my grandmother never got mad at Dana Light, was mad at me that day. She said, boy, if you don't get up there and clean that mess up, you better. I'm going to tie your hat on the pieces. If you don't clean that up, boy, you get up there, you clean that up right now. <laughs> I go, you okay, Grandma? Okay, Grandma. So I got teased. By the, the my brother, they call me Stinky because I stunk up the house. I, I was called Stinky for for a long, a long, long time. Then I remember one day I never saw my father yet, and I think I was around. Oh my goodness, how old, old was I when the first time I saw him? I'm just making a guess here. I want to say I was seven. The first time I, I I saw my dad, and he came. And my mother said, your dad is coming home today. I want you kids to clean up the yard, you know, clean things up. So we said, okay, mom. So I was out sweeping the yard. Now, our yard was dirt. The, inside our house, we didn't have wooden floors or floors like you guys got. Like I said, it was old slave shacks where the slaves lived there years and years ago when America had slaves. So the floor was dirt. So I would try to get out of cleaning, doing my chores. So uh, and how my mother knew if I swept the floor, because if with a dirt floor, when you step on it, dust would come up if it had not been uh, swept. But if you sweep it, when you step on it, no dust came up. So my mother, when she stepped on that floor, and she see that dust rise up from the floor. And every move you make, dust will keep rising, rising. By the end of the day, the whole house is full of dust. You can see it. It's like a, a cloud. You're like a dust storm being in your house. And then another thing, we had these old uh, stove that at, at the end of the year, your walls could be white or blue or green, no matter what color your walls are. At the end of at the end of winter, your walls were black because they had to suck. Would get all over everything on your clothes, on everything. Don't you know suck? So that was there every year. You had to do definitely the spring cleaning. Then you had to clean the wall, clean the suck off off, off everything. But anyway, the first time I saw my father, he walked in. He had a three piece suit on. I was sweeping the front yard. And a, a guy lived across the street, lived with Miss Keisha. And his name was Tippy Tom because we called him Tippy Tom because he was real, real tall. He probably about 6'6", six, six, but back back in the 50s, you know, a guy 6'6", six, six, or in the 50s, 6 was considered, a, you know, a pretty tall guy. You know, not like today, you know, we got seven footers. But back then, if you were 6'6", six, six, you was compared to a pretty tall guy. So we called him Tippy Tom. He was carrying two water pails. And he looked at me and said, boy. You know who that man is? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I think that's my dad. He said, yeah, that's your dad, boy. So then I came up and I said, how you doing, dad? He said, you know who I am, boy? I said, yeah, I, I know who you are. 
He said, where your mom? I said, she's at work. He said, I got something for you, boy. Come here. He gave me a, play, a payday candy bar. That was the first thing I ever got from my father. And the only thing I ever got, never gave me anything out that, 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 that candy bar. Give me that candy bar. So then he came home. Him and my mom, they got along for a little while. He went out to look for work. But in Lowmore, if you didn't work for the railroad, the only other work you did were uh, for farmers. You know, go work for the different farmers because there was there was only one store that was called the Commissary. It was owned by the North and Rest of the Railroad. So he, if things didn't work out too well for him, he just kept getting angrier and angrier. So he tried to make the best of it. So I'm on one day, he going to plant a garden. So me and him, we went way out. We dug up. We didn't have tractors or cultivated stuff. So we used a pick, a rake, and a hoe. We did it all manually. Three three items we had. A, 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 a rake, a, a, a hoe, and a pick. That was it. You use the pick to break it up. You pick all the rocks out. Then you use the hoe to make the rows and everything. And you smooth it out with the rake. And then you cut your trenches. You plant your stuff. Well, anyway, we had a cherry tree sitting there. So I said, oh, that's pretty nice. Them cherries look good. I ain't eating all day long. I'm going to go get me some cherries. So I walk across my dad's garden to get these cherries. So when my dad came home, came back, and he was drunk. I don't know where he get money for liquor from. And came home drunk. And who been in my garden? So. I didn't want my brothers to get in trouble, so I said, I did. I said, I wanted to get some cherry. He whooped the hell out of me that night. I got my first whooping by my dad. So my dad gave me two things when he came home, a candy bar and an ass whooping. So that's my meeting with my father. One day, my dad said, boy, you want to make some money? I said, yeah. He said, come on with me. So we go down to a place called Scrapper's Corner in Lowmore. If people that live in that area, they know what I'm talking about, especially the older people. And what they do, the railroad men with Gamma at this corner. See, they didn't have nightclubs and places like that for black people to go to. So you have to make the best of, of what you have. So they had this corner where all the black guys would hang out after work and everything. They stay there till you know, 12, 1 o'clock uh, uh, in the morning. And they shoot dice. It was, dice was the thing. They're shooting that dice, you know. So, and they have fights. Stage fight, you know, like boxing and stuff like that. So my dad said, the moment I taught you how to hit a man, but my dad had a belief. He said, if he ever hit you and you don't go down, he's going to walk around behind you to see what's holding you up. That was his, he believed, you know, he boxed a little bit in the military. He was a cook in the military, but he was on the boxing team too. So he knew exactly how to, to where to strike that. Tell me to catch him right on that chin right there. You hit him hard, you get right on that chin. Forget about all this here. Don't hit him in the head. You're going to hurt your hands. Catch him right on that chin. So I would try to put my weight behind and hit you right on that chin to knock you out. And then he told me I was going to fight this guy. And they bet some money. It was $5 on the table. Back then for a black guy, $5, that was a lot of money. That was a weak pay for most people back in them days. So I wanted that, my dad wanted that five bucks. So he said, boy, if you lose this fight, you're going to get it worse when you got home. So I kept fighting this guy. I just wouldn't give up. He busted my lip, black in my eyes. He beating the crap out of me. Finally, I saw that open and I cold cocked him. I saw his leg gives a little bit. And I hit him again. His leg gave some more. And then I just drew back, gave him everything I there. I dropped him. I dropped him. I was so proud of myself. I couldn't hardly stand up myself, you know. I was sore for a week. You know, my mother wanted to kill him for, for doing that to me, you know. But anyway, he got his $5. Finally, one day, the last time I, up to the last time I saw my dad. Can I cut in here? Yes. What did you get? Because you said he would be, you, he asked if you wanted to make some money. I didn't. Did well, you I, get any of that? Yeah, I've. I got some fat back and some and, and, and some navy beans. <laughs> you go out. See, back then we call it fat back. You see it now they call that salt pork. But they sell you a little bit of square like 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 this now. And they want a whole lot of money. We get a slab was that big. And you slice it like you slice bacon. 
and you get that pork belly. We, all, we call all that fat back up. Most, well, even bacon is mostly fat if you stop and look at. And they would slice it, and 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 that and that, uh, it would last you a long time. And we fry that 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 fat back and put it in some some them navy bean, and that's what I got out of it. I think you could get back in them days. Everything was sold by the bushel. There was no pounds. So if, if, when you went and bought a ham, you bought a ham that had the tail on it and the foot on it. I mean, that ham was, was like this, not one of these little, y'all buy shanks, but we bought a ham. So when you bought ribs, you bought the whole side of a cow. You know, it wasn't like what you get now. And when you went out back veggie, you got a busher basket and they full the busher basket up. So finally, the last time I saw my dad, he came home one day drunk. And what he did, he went to my mother's job and got her check. And my mother said, have you seen your dad? And all of them go, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, I, I, I didn't, didn't see my dad. So finally, my dad came home drunk. My mother said, I want y'all kids going and make me a fire. So we had this big wooden stove. We thought he thrown wood into this wooden stove, getting it nice and hot. The stove got hot. We said, Mom, the stove hot. She said, not hot enough, not hot enough. More, more, more. My mom, it's August. We're sweating. Said, mom, come on. Do what I say, boy. Don't let me tell you again. My mother always said that. Don't let me tell you again. We knew what she said that. <laughs> she won't tell you again. The next time she tell you, you're with that switch. You know, <laughs> my mother was not, uh, how you say, uh, th there was no democracy. <laughs> you want democracy? Don't live in my mother's house. Dictatorship. Dictatorship. That, that, that was it. You know, she she was Putin. My mom was never been a Putin. <laughs> yeah, none of none of that stuff we do here. We pay my mother. Well, you under my roof, my roof. But anyway, we got that stove as hot as we could get it. And they said, "Okay, you kids go on outside. Here come my dad, drunk, cursing, and everything." Now my dad was a tough guy. You know, he was part Scottish, uh, part Scottish, and part uh, part black. And he was a regular, couldn't nobody in town beat my dad. Couldn't nobody in that whole town beat my dad. And my mother knew what a good fighter he was. He was a hell of a hell of a fighter. He was known for his fighting. He would, That was his reputation in the neighborhood. Fighting and womanizing. That was my dad. Good fighter and a womanizer. So my dad came home. My mo mother said, you kids going out in the yard play. So we out there on the porch and we scared to death because we think mom's gonna beat up, gonna beat up my dad. So all of a sudden we hear some rumbling, 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 rumbling. And we we thought my mother, you know, we and my brother Noah said, let's go get him. We all gonna jump on my dad. All of a sudden I hear my dad screaming and hollering. I go, holy Christ. So we open up the door. My mother had grabbed him by the back, grabbed him by the leg. Picked him up on her shoulders like this and set his butt on that hot stove. <laughs> she got it. We, now we have to get mom off of him. <laughs> mom, you gonna burn daddy up? <laughs> daddy on <will> fire. <laughs> And, uh, and when you mother, you gotta go to that well to get water. <laughs> they ain't like you go to the speaker, turn the water on. My dad took off running. Now here come my mother right behind him. We didn't know she had this. She went under her mattress and pulled out a Smith and Rest of 38 with a long ass barrel. <laughs> then we hear bang, bang, bang. We said, oh, Lord, mom just killed dad. <laughs> dad is dead. My mother come back in the house and said, your father is the luckiest man in the world that bullets cannot turn corners. <laughs> I didn't see my dad no more until I was 21. <laughs> Never came back out there. My mother gonna put, she gonna bust land in my pops now. I'm surprised. Uh, you oh man! Oh yeah. Back. See, this was what life was like when I was a kid. See, I said there's a lot of people. Uh, uh, seventy five percent of black kids grew up without a father. So my mother said, "Son, now that your father is gone, I have to be both." father and mother to you. Now, it's a father job to teach their kids how to protect themselves and how to be self-sufficient. That's the father job. Mothers too, but more morely the father. So I remember one day, my brother Walter, he said, living, living, I roll out. He could tell you the same story. This guy named Buzz Sawyer jumped on Walter. Walter was probably been about six or seven. You know, we were kids. You know, none of us were 12 years old then. We were all you know, between the age of five, ten. And my mother said, look, I can't be here every day to protect you you boys. Y'all got to learn how to protect yourself. So 
my mother said, well, well where is he? And he had a, 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 a father that had one leg. I think they were John Thomas or something like that. They had one leg. And uh, my mother said, you kids come with me. I'm going to teach you all how to protect yourself. So <clears throat> she took us down to the creek. The creek had dried out with nothing in there but rocks. She said, get them water pails and fill these water pails up with rocks. So we got them water pails, you know, fill them up with rocks. She said, don't make this so heavy where you can't carry it now. You want to, but you want to have enough rocks in there. So I get the rocks and, and we walk behind my mother and everything. And we think mother going to kick his butt. So all of a sudden we saw John Thomas walking with his crutches, you know. So then my mother said, okay, rock him. Said, what? <laughs> rock him? What do you think? Take a rock and throw it, hit him. Hit him with them rocks. So all of us kids started throwing rocks at this old man. And he's running down the street with them crutches like this. Tell a bunch of little kids running behind him. And we rocked the hell out of that old man. He messed my little brother up. And then, <laughs> then his son, who was probably about 18 or 19, he going to get involved in my mom. Getting in her car. She had a 1949 Chevrolet, uh, what's it called a halfback, you know, with it came straight down like that. So, with this old abandoned church, he, and my mother chased him, trying to run him over with the car. He run inside the church. My mother drive the car up the freaking step through the church after him. <laughs> <laughs> Big B drove that car up the freaking step oh. through the freaking oh. door. Right out of this old, right out of the sun. So my mother, when he ran out the other end of the church, the car came out behind him. Like what you see in a freaking movie or something. Cracked her windshield and every damn thing. So when he came to the other side, my mother said, don't let him get away. Rock him too. So we started rocking him too. So that's how my mother taught us how to protect herself. <laughs> if you mess with us kids, you're going to get rocked. We didn't have no guns or knives or nothing, but we fist fight every day. I remember the the first time I got in a fight, uh, and I this guy named Ursa Golfer. Now I was probably about seven or eight at the time. Ursa was probably about fifteen or sixteen years old. He was about ten years older than me. He was like a bullet guy. He was probably about five foot ten, maybe six feet. Great basketball player, a uh, light skinned guy. You know, one of them real bright skin, kind of like Ernie Ladd, real light like Ernie Ladd. So anyway, we got into it over ice cream. There was this guy across the street would take and make his own ice cream. He had an ice cream turner where he put the salt and all the stuff in to make the ice cream. And so he had one ice cream left. So he gave it to me. Roger of uh, 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 Ursa Goffin already had his ice cream, but because I was a small kid, he said, you're going to take my ice cream. So he took my ice cream. Me and him got in a fight. He beat the crap out of me. I've never been whooped so bad in my life. So I went home and the mother saw me busting the old black eye. Lips, you know, my head looked like a Hershey bar. I had so many knots on it. So I said, what happened to you, boy? I said, well, I got in a fight. She said, with who? I told her who I got in a fight with. She said, did you win? I go, no, ma'am. Did you run away? I go, yes, ma'am. She said, come on with me, boy. So my mother take off walking. <clears throat> now, remember, my mother was five foot eight, 300 pounds. They used to call her Big B. So Big B took off. Come on. No, come on with me. Boom. Boom, boom. That's how she walked. Boom, 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 boom. In fact, I walked just like my mom. If you ever met my mom, everybody would say, that boy walked like his mom. When you see me walk to the ring, that's how my mom walked. This black man is imitating my walk now, which is my mother's walk. He don't know he's walking like my mom. <laughs> Every time he go down the ring, I said, look at him walking like my mom. Cause I walk like my mom. So anyway, <clears throat> when we get to the garden, my, my mother said, where's that boy that beat you up? I said, that's him. She said, you mean that old tall, high yaller? We call him High Yala, you know, which, which really means mulatto. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, get him. So I looked at my mom and just beat me. She said, I don't care. You go out there and you fight him again. So I went out there and I fought him again. He kicked the crap out of me again. So my mother pat me on the back. You did good, boy. Now tomorrow, I want you to do the same thing all over again. What are you talking about, mom? She said, I want you to keep fighting him until he quit. I said, Mom, why would he quit? He keep I he beat my butt. Family just went on for about three or four days. Three or four days. And uh one day I came and he saw me coming and then I said, Oh, here come Tony. And they knew it was gonna be a fight. Cause my mother said jump him every time I see him. So every time I saw him, I jumped for about three or four days. Family, he told me, he said, Tony, 
tell your mom you won today. I, I don't want to fight you no more. And I got the name of, of uh, being crazy. In fact, my nickname was Argo. Because I would volunteer. Anytime there was a fight, somebody said, anybody want to fight? Argo. <laughs> Argo. I do. I would volunteer for anything. I don't like a, ten, a Virginia, Tennessee. You know, volunteer. Believe it or not, I did that same thing. That stuck with me not only just in my childhood, but in my adulthood. When I got into a scrape uh, with Saito, uh, Mr. Fuji partner, and me and him got a fight, and we fought for three or four days. Finally, Vince McMahon Sr. called us into the office, and he said, look, if you guys fight, the next time you guys fight, he said, Tony, I'm going to fire you. Saito, you going back to Japan. So if y'all fight again, you both are done here. You know, this is not, you know, I don't want no more fighting in the dressing room. And so that led into, you know, uh, my later years. Now, I remember one story, and I was around six. I know I'm all over the place because this is my childhood. I hope some of y'all be able to follow me. We had a church. Uh, they had no playground. So we had a church that we would go to, and we played baseball, and we would do stuff. And uh, like I said, when we worked, you didn't get money. Like, you get they there was what's called horse training. So if I go and help you pick tomatoes, at the end of the day, you give me a bushel basket of a tomato. If I go and help you clean out, if I go clean out your chicken coop for you, which I hate doing because chicken poop is the worst in the world, then at the end of the day, you would give me a couple of dozen of eggs. And it was in these crates, you know, these egg crates. So you had, oh my goodness, 24, 48, you had about 100 eggs. There were about 100 eggs there. So you take them home. The guy said, oh, you take these home to your mom, boy, and bring my crate back. Because they want the crate. You can have the eggs, but bring that crate back. If they gave you a bush of basses or green beans or whatever you did, they gave it to them. I used to love it in Slaughter Hall. Because when we go to Slaughter Hall, they would give you ham or they give you a big slab of ribs. You know, you, they gave you stuff. Uh, and there was no money at chain. Well, most of this food was called horse trading. They would come back to mom, I, Miss, Miss James, I'd like to use your boys to do something. So one day, this guy named Red Eye Hinton, and we all knew he was old clanks. He was really involved with the KKK at the time. He was proud about it, too. I mean, he walked around in his uniform. All, you know, he, he was proud about being, being a clanksman. But he was a nice guy, and my mother liked him because he gave us boys work. One day, we had to go to, to uh, get up some hay for him. We were going to get up some hay for, for his horses. Well, after we get up the hay and everything, it was time for him to pay us. Well, he had two sons, Harold and Ron Hinton. Ron was okay, but Harold was a mean little son of a bitch. So Harold, he was hair lip. I don't know if y'all hear hair lip. I don't mean to take, make fun of nobody that talk, but I'm going to do it just so the fans will understand what I'm saying. Harold would come and say, Hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me. You boy, go ahead and get that head damn head up. You old stupid little nigga, you. He, I'll call me nigga all the time. You little nigga. Cleft Come on, you little nigga. Is that a cleft lip? Yeah, yeah. We call it a hair lip. Yep. In the South, yeah, we call yep. that a hair lip. Yeah, you little nigga. Move that head. Move that head, nigga. Come on, nigga. He kept on messing with me. So, finally, it was time for us to get something. We don't move all that hay for him. The job was done. Seven o'clock in the afternoon, we sitting around waiting for Red Eye Hinton to come and give us something. Red Eye said, run them off. Run them niggas off my lot. So old Harold and Ron, they just off throw rocks at us. So I remember my mom said, I had some rocks in my pocket. Now, I probably couldn't have done this again in a hundred years. I just stopped, turned, and I threw one rock. Hit old Harold right in the freaking head. Put a knot on him like this. He started crying. He ran home. So that I thought that would be the end of. So he had two fields. Old Red Eye hit. So he had this small field. He said, "Miss B, I need to use your boys." My mother said, "Well, you didn't give him nothing last time. Are you sure you're gonna pay him this time? Don't worry. I'm gonna your boy gonna get exactly what coming to him. You watch, Miss B. I'm gonna make sure he get what what coming to him." My mother said, "Well, thank you, there, Mister Hinton, because you were very respectful." My mother was, and uh, back then you better be. They burn your house down back then. You know, come in and beat the hell up. My father was gone with just my mother and us kids, so she was very very polite to these old white men. You know, so anyway, make a long story short. We finished that small field, and uh, here come an old red eye hinting on his tractor. Hey, boy, I hear you jumped my boys when they wasn't looking and caught them off guard. I want you to fight them now. 
and you bar not hit them back. They going to get even with you for what you did to them. You bar not fight them back. So me back up a little bit. We got in a fight earlier. I threw a rock at them. Then they tried to jump me. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Then they tried to jump me in the back of that church. Well, when I was in the back of that church, I started fighting them. Boom, 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 boom. I'm just swinging. I don't know what I'm hitting. I'm just swinging, swinging, swinging. So I hear people in the crowd say, look at Tony go. That got me going more. You know? Look at Tony go. Oh, he's whooping both of them. Oh, wow. Look at that Tony. Boy, he's a good fighter, just like his dad. Boy, he's beating both of them. He's beating both of them. So I beat him up. That's when Red Eye Hinton and all the all the black people, I was the hero of the black neighborhood. Oh, yeah, Tony, you really put it to them. Yeah, you stood up. Yeah, right on. I mean, I was everybody was patting on the back, patting, you know, giving me stuff to eat. And, you know, I was a big hero in town. Then here come old Red Eye hitting on his truck. He said, Miss B, I want to use your boy. I want that one there. So he picked me. I went with him. And uh, when I got there, I cleaned the field for him. And he said, I hear you jump my boys uh, behind the church when they wasn't looking and you beat them up when they wasn't looking. I said, no, sir. Uh, they jumped me first. He said, you calling me a liar, boy? I said, no, sir. I wouldn't do that, sir. I, I definitely, he was a big man, too. Maybe about 350 pounds, maybe even 400 pounds. He was just a big, big old man. So I was scared to death for him anyway. So he said, I want y'all, I want y'all, y'all, my boys. I said, okay, you boys, you beat, you beat that nigga. So they started jumping on me, hit me. I go, that's enough. That's enough, Mr. Hinton. Mr. Hinton, that's enough, Mr. Hinton. So Fanny, he wouldn't listen to me. So I started doing what I did in the park. I am started swinging, fighting back. Next day I know I felt a sharp pain in my back. He had stabbed me in the back with a pitchfork and drove me to the ground. And then his son started kicking me and beating me while he held me down with that pitchfork. Here's the part that got me. When I got up from there, there were probably about 10 or 15 black men and women standing around watching. This white man pulled me down while these two white boys kicked the shit out of me. And this was at first they were bragging about how well I fought the two boys. But then when the, when the father got involved, now this is what they were saying about me now. I knew that Tony was a troublemaker. He's not but a troublemaker. He had no business jumping on them boys. He could have walked away from that fight. He didn't have to do that fight because they now they're afraid that this man going to retaliate against them too. So right then and there, I knew that I was pretty much on my own. And my mother told us, you never hang your dirty laundry out to dry. She said, the only person that's going to protect me is me. And I, I learned that early on as a young kid. But anyway, moving on with the story, uh, there might be, I may go back and forth to, to Lone War, but that's pretty much how my childhood was. By the time that I was 12 years old, I must have been in about 30 fist fights before my 12th uh, uh, birthday. It was an everyday thing. You go out to play basketball, you got a little jingle in your pocket, the guy would jump. I remember one time we went out, took a train. Me and my brother. And most of the time, you know, it was segregation. So black kids couldn't go into the white neighborhood. So my brother, Norris, was pretty smart. He said, hey, I got an idea. I said, what? That's us become ghosts. And I said, I don't want to be no ghost. No, no, it, it's going to work. We're going to become ghosts. So we took these sheets and we cut little holes in it and put it over top of us. Then we went into the white neighborhood to get the good candy. Because in the black neighborhood, all we got was that homemade stuff. Or Apple. <laughs> you didn't get that good candy like we saw on TV. You saw that Bay Root, them Hershey bar, and Rob Mouth. But we my mother couldn't afford none of that. So it was always some homemade taffy or some rock candy or some peanut butter. I like the peanut butter, but everything was homemade, which we got all the time. And that's what our apple or orange. We didn't get the candy we saw on TV. So now you go into the white neighborhood, you get the you get the good candy. So we were in the white neighborhood to get the good candy. As I was coming back, some of the older kids that was at the teenage boy, they jumped us and they took our candy away. You know. And then I said, man, I got to find out something to to uh, make myself, you know, bother at what I do. So after living in Lowmore, Covington, and Clifton Forge in my earlier years, there's a lot more that I could say, but uh, I don't have the time to do it. I got uh, these I, people came. Yes. How about you? You've talked about your brother. 
Mm -hmm. You haven't actually talked much about him specifically. Tell us about your, all your brothers and your sisters. Well, I, uh, my mother had nine kids. When my, when my father separated from my mother, he took the girls and one boy. There were three girls. They were triplets. My mother didn't want to break up the triplet. And there was a boy and a girl which were twins, Shermer and Shirley. And they got sent away when I was probably around five years old. And and I I never seen them a day in my life. You know I'm an old man now. I got I got four sisters and one brother which I never seen because they left with to to go to Richmond. My father went to Richmond because he figured you know that was a better place. He tried to get my mother to go with him, but my grandmother did not want to live in the city. She was born as a country girl. She was going to die as a country girl. So she wanted to stay uh, in the country, even though there was no work for my dad. My dad went and eventually got a, a job at, at Philip Morris, the tobacco place up in uh, uh, Richmond, worked for Philip Morris. But uh, after he left, I got to fight. I had to learn how to protect myself and everything. So finally, these people came to the house because uh, I came to school the dirty all the time. Uh, I took a bath maybe once every month or two. I mean, a bath for like a month and a thing to me. I never combed my hair. First time I combed my hair, I was 12 years old. We didn't have combs. So we just get in that tub and you wash off and that was it. In the summer, you go jump in the creek. Because like I said, you didn't have showers. You have to haul that water from the well, heat it. You know how many buckets you had to dump in that tub to fill up that tub, you know? You had about 10 buckets you had to, the, before. And then after three people, it ain't water no more. It's mud. You're taking a freaking mud bag. You're more dirty going in and then coming out. You know, that's, that that was life not just for black people. It was just life for a lot of, you know, poor people, white and black, Jewish, Indian, no matter what you were. That was life in Roanoke for, for a lot of people. So they, they, they sent me to this place. They're called the Virginia Negro Baptist Trinity Home. And that's where, really, where my development came. This was life at the Baptist Trinity Home. You get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. At 6, you got to feed all the, the animals and let the cows out to pasture. You slop the hog, feed the chicken. Feed the, the horses, the mules, whatever animal they had. They had horses, mules, and animal. It was called the Virginia Negro Baptist General. And I think it was on Root Flat 5 in Chesterfield, Virginia. Chesterfield is up near Petersburg. It's not it's on outside of Petersburg. So you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. At 6, you, you, feed, you feed up. They call it feed up. At 7, you have breakfast. At 8, you're in the fields working. You know, we, we cut, we haul put wood, we, we worked in the field. They had 600 some acres of farmland. And, and, and you did farm work all day long. And at 11 o'clock, no, it was 11, yeah, 11.30, 11.30 to 12.30, you would have lunch. And then from 4.30 to 5.30, you would have dinner. And then at 6, you would feed up, you know. And the thing about cows, Every day, I went to this and told him, go get the cows. And we must have had about 20 or 30 heads of cows there. So he said, go get them cows. I would walk to the field. The cow would see me. They started coming on their own. They just knew it was time to come home. They would, they would just leave leave the field and start walking back to the pen all, all by themselves. All they had to do is just walk out that field, and the cows would see me, and they started coming. They just knew it was time, and time, time. Uh, to go. Another thing I learned uh, at that place, I had a dog named Duke. He was a puppy. And the guy that ran the place was Mr. Garden Harris. I said, Mr. Harris, can I keep that puppet? They said, well, his mother died, and we were going to give him away to, you know, one of these places where they would say dogs and stuff. Come, can't feed. I said, I'll take care of Mr. Mr. Garden. So he said, you sure? It's a lot of work. I said, yes, sir. He was a boxer. It was, it was brown and white boxer named Duke. So me and Duke was the best of friends. I mean, Duke went everywhere with me. I mean, I tried to get him to sleep with me. I used to slip him in 
slip them in the, the dormitory uh, late at night. They could catch she, she old Duke that I got in trouble for bringing Duke in the house and all this and that stuff. So I would take Duke everywhere I go. Finally, one day Duke was out, and this guy had these two German shepherds. He was he used to train uh, police dogs for the military and uh, and for police, you know, attack dog, big old German shepherd. Where Duke got in a fight with both of them, and they bit a big plug out of his uh, out of his hip, and Duke died. And after Duke died, it broke my heart so much. I never got another dog. I, I just couldn't have another dog. Then we had a bull named Tweaky. See, all the animals we have, they were what called black Angus. They had no horn. They were black Angus, and Tweaky was. I mean, Tweaky looked like Andre. I mean, he was a huge, huge bull, you know. And at nighttime, he used to break out all the time. So finally, what they had to do with Tweaky, I remember getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning. We had to take a rope and put it around his back ankle and trip him so he go down. And they put a big ring in his nose. The other way, at night, they could tie Tweaky up so he don't he don't get up. Once they got it on that you know, all the other cows would follow him, and they get hit by a car or something. So they had to put a ring in it. Then we had a mule named Tom. And I want to tell y'all something. I am dumber than a mule. <laughs> the first time Mr. Harris told me, he said, Tony, I want you to go get get Tom. We got to do some color vape today. We got to plow them field. We didn't have tractors then. We had one tractor, but we still used the old mule. So I went to get old Tom. Tom was slew for the car, didn't have no horseshoe. Slew for the minute the foot with the, the his his hoof would turn up. Like like that slew footed they call it. And uh they had to clip him. They had a thing that would they cut the cut the hoof because they would just spread out, you know. And so Tom was smart. He knew that we were gonna make him work. He didn't know want to work. So one day they told me, he said, Tony, I want you to go get Tom to put the blanders on. The blanders are two things you put like that. Put them blanders on old Tom. So I said, okay. I didn't listen. Hard head, make a soft head. I got a whoop for not doing that uh, by, by Mr. Harris. But anyway, make a long story short, I hook up the singer tree to him, hook him up and everything. If I bring Tom out the bar, Tom started limping. He's limping. Mr. Harris saw this all, oh, put him back in the bomb, get Susie Q. Susie Q was a red mule, but it was a female mule, but Susie Q would run with that plow. Like she was just, she wasn't mature yet, she was a young mule, so you hook the plow, but she would run with that plow, you know, the work, the work, hell of a working mule. Tom be limping. So at the end of the day, we're going to put Susie Q up. Mr. Harris said, Tony, come over here, I want to show you something. So I look out in the field, here's old Tom walking around. Nothing wrong with it. Tom turned his head and saw us. Tom go. <laughs> <laughs> He's selling. <laughs> when he saw us, he went right back to limping again. You know, ain't nothing wrong with Tom. He said, I said, man, I thought mules were stupid. He said, no, he said, horses are stupid. You hook a horse up to a plow, up stump. He would pull until he'd kill himself. He ain't got sense enough to stop. A mule would pull a little bit. And if he don't hear that popping in that wood, or that, if that don't start to move, he stop. He ain't going to move until you dig around that stump a little bit. And once you start to dip, he said, help him, you. And he try again. If he don't hear that wood start popping, he stop again. You pull right there. And then he pull. And all of a sudden, he hear that popping. And then he, he, and then, and then, and then, and then he dig in there. Because he know he could do it. And, and boy, us kids are getting excited. Say, all right, Tom. Help me, Tom. So Tom started digging in, and we get a holler that Tom dig in, and when he when that long, when we finally get that stump out, we celebrate, and that damn mule celebrate too. He, 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 he's happy. So he's fighting in the car and all, you know. That's what old Tom would do. Then we take him out the barn, we brush him down. He's happy as hell. Another time, I went to get old Tom. Tom got between me. And the wall. And I'm going to put them blanders on it. Tom just did this to me. And laid on me. It's like that. Now, Mr. Harris, everybody said, where's that Tony? Wait, he's, he's ducking work again. He's ducking work again. They said, no. Tom won't let him out. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to call him. Help, Tom. Help. 
Start hitting Tom on the ass, get him off it. They said, don't you ever get between you and old Tom at that wall. Say, Tom will outsmart you every time. You don't have the sense of a mule, boy, which I didn't. So then with some of the story, another thing that, I, that we did at the Virginia Negro Baptist Church Home was fight. They would draw a circle. You have a disagreement with someone. They would draw a circle in the, in the dirt. And whoever had a two disagreement, you two, y'all get in. You can't grab each other. It got to be not but physical. And we just keep fighting until one person give up or one person almost uh, getting hurt. The funny thing about some of these childhood stories that I tell you, like, like I wouldn't, that if you fight me today, you got to fight me tomorrow. Happened to me in wrestling with Saido. Well, believe it or not, it happened. This happened to me again. Went from the Baptist Chimney home to Mid South. Bill Watts was that way. You had a disagreement. He put he, the guy would circle you in the middle of the dressing room and you fight it out. After the fight is over, I don't want to hear no more about it. It's kind of odd that what I learned at the Baptist Chimney home became stuff. The same thing happened to me in the world in the world of uh, uh, wrestling. And like the same thing with Red Eye Hinton, when I turn around, when I work and not get paid, same thing happened in wrestling. And even Larry and a lot of wrestling tell you, you go work for a promoter, and in a day, the promoter, like Nick Gutis, tried not to pay me and Tommy Rich. I went to Africa, got stuck, didn't get paid. Uh, I've been in a lot of places where, you know, I got screwed all my money, even including North Carolina and Virginia. So it was like history, my childhood came back around real kind of string in the uh, restaurant. So I stayed at the Baptist Children's Home later on yesterday. Why don't you go back and say why you went to the Baptist show? Because I was all nasty and dirty, and the kid was complaining about how I smell. So they turned me over to the state. So the state told my mother, said, we got to take two of the boys from you. So they sent me and Charles. Walter with the baby stayed. My brother Norris left. He went to the job corps first. And then at 15, he had my mother's sad paper. So he go to the military. He served 35 years in the uh, United States on it. My brother Norris, you know, he's retired now. He lives in Washington State. I talked to him uh, occasionally. He's he's in his seventies now. Great guy, not somebody I want to fight with. You know, he was a ranger. He did a lot of special uh, ops stuff. I asked him one time. I said, "Brother, what you did when you was in the military?" He's like, "He's like, I will tell you, but if I do, I have to kill you." So I didn't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever you want to say, bro. Then my brother Walter, he stayed at home uh, with my mom. And Charles ran away from the Baptist Church at home and, and wouldn't go back. So they, they let him stay home with mom. But, but I stayed, and I fell in love with this girl named uh, Jean Allen. Beautiful girl. And I remember getting a fight over her because there was another kid that liked her too. So Mr. Harris said, well, y'all have to fight over her. Whoever win get to get to take her, uh, get get to date her. So I got my butt kicked So because I was smaller and weaker. But but he he beat me up. I fought him for about a week. Then I got, every time I fought him, I got a beat. I fought him. They beat me for fighting. I fought him. I said, shit, this ain't working out. <laughs> like a freaking kid. Not like my mama said. <laughs> no, it worked out great. <laughs> and low boy cut the fall. Ain't working out too good. You know, I said, well, maybe I, I should disobey my mom just for this one time because I don't know what it's worth. This guy beating the crap. I remember of, of Mr. Hare whooped my ass with that strap. So the Baptist Church Home was a great place for me. I went in. When I, when I left the Baptist Church Home, oh, boy, did I get big. I was 185 pounds when I left there. When I went there, I was probably about, 100 and, about 120, 110. I mean, I was like a bean pole. I was exactly. so tall. Yeah, I was so tall. My mother always told me I should be a basketball player. But then when I came back, I had 16-inch arms. For, you know, we, you know we, we saw wood. You know, cross-cut saw, swung double axe, did the whole walk behind a mule. I used to take a, 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 a they used to cut the six foot, the, 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 the put wool was six feet. I would take a six foot log, set it on my shoulder, throw it up on the trailer. I threw 200 pound hay bales around. Oh, I'll tell y'all this story before I, before I get out of the, the Baptist Trinity Home. Sometimes people would come by the Baptist Trinity Home to get kids to do work for them. Now, anybody ever haul hay, know you have to wear a long sleeve shirt. If you don't, the, the hay would scratch up your arm. So I got this long sleeve shirt on, and they and this guy decided he going to cut the hay while it was still green. 
Most people don't do that. But he wanted to cut it while it was still green. Why? We don't know. We didn't have to just do what it said. So I grabbed one of them hay bales and I threw it up on the trailer. And it was old black snake in that hay bale. <laughs> and he said, tell my damn arm. I took off running and hollering and screaming. And I'm stripping as I'm going. I'm taking my shirt off. I took my pants off. By the time I got to the end of the field, I was standing there buck naked. I ain't had a stitch of clothes on. And I'm still. And where that snake? Because I'm scared enough of a snake. Well, I'm saying that, that I still can feel that snake, even though he ain't on me no more. So the man that was, the, the, the white guy that was sitting on his tractor, he laughed, he laughed. Every time he came by there, he said, I want that boy there. He said, he's not the best worker, but he's going to do something <laughs> before <laughs> this day is out. He's going to do something to make me laugh. Sure enough, the next day, I'm going to help his daughter. She had a what the outdoor thing where you the big flower got the glass on it? Oh, the greenhouse? Greenhouse. She had a greenhouse and she made a lot of flowers. She sold them to different places, you know, took them to stores. That was her business. Anyway, she had her son, me and Charles were there. She had a son that uh uh she bought him uh a, a Zorro outfit. He had a mask, the black hat the vest, and had a, the little chaps pants, you know. He had a little six-shooter, you know, fake gun. We're not a real gun. You know, a little cap gun. And he had a whoop. So he come in there. We was in the field. We working. He go, get the work, nigga. Hit me with that damn whoop. Whoa. Get the work, nigga. Hit me with that whoop again. I, you better cut that out. So Charles said, you better stop that. I'm telling him off. You go tell what you want, nigga. I hit you too. What? He hit Charles. Charles get back. I'm gonna tell your mom. So Charles hit he hit Charles again. Charles took off to go get his mom. So he kept hitting me there. What about the man? Stop that. Stop. So if he wouldn't stop. I reached down in my shoes. I took my shoelaces out. I tied them together. And I took my shoelaces. I whooped the hell out of his little white ass. His mother, came. <laughs> his mother came. What are you doing, my boy? What are you doing, my boy? I'm trying to explain to her. I'm telling your mom, you gonna get a whooping when you get home. Sure enough, I get home, I get a whooping because I'm not supposed to hit a white kid. I hit a white kid twice in my life. I hit a white kid both times. I got in trouble for it. The old hitting boys, and uh, that's why I like wrestling. I can beat up white people and not go to jail. <laughs> you know, that's my first time beating up white folks. I didn't end up in jail for doing it, but. That that was life the way it was uh, when I was a kid. There's a lot more to tell about my life, but then I came home uh, for the Virginia Negro Baptist Trinity home. I came over to Virginia Baptist Trinity home, and my mother had moved from uh, uh, from Covington. Oh, there's one thing that I want to tell y'all. Uh, I got a, just a few more minutes on this segment. If you ever go to Clifton Forge, there's a rock. There's a rock. I'm going to try to find a picture of it to show y'all with the face of Jesus on it. it. was right down the street. What happened, they told me the story. I wasn't there, but old people told me the story that they were these ministers and deacons. They were out drinking and swearing. All of a sudden, the cloud got dark. It started lightning and thunder, and it rolled off the hill. And uh, when it rolled off the hill, they picked it up. They put this rock on top of another rock, automatically the water slide come out of this rock. It's right there today. I took a picture of it probably about five years ago. Got the face of Jesus on it. Nobody carved it. And water is coming out. They they try to cap it off in a cake. They try to move the rock in a cake. That's why I believe in God because I I, and I tell you, I gotta tell this story before I end this segment. A guy named Jerry Hayes, uh, me and him and a girl was walking. He liked the girl, I didn't know it. The girl liked me, but she didn't like Jerry. So what ended up happening, if y'all look closer, she has a dent in my head right here. <laughs> there sure see that is. dent? See that dent? And then if you look, if you see me, I got a, a crack to go across here. Jerry Hay pushed me. I told, I was looking, I said, because the creek was dried up. So I said, Jerry, look, the creek had dried up. Jerry came up and said, I'm going to push you. I said, you but not. So just as I said, you but not, he pushed me head first. I fell, cracked my skull. And my scar, you could move my scar just like this. I go home to my grandmother. My mother was at work. She said, if you pray to God, um, he would give you what you want. So I asked God to be strong like Samson, built like Hercules, and have a lot of friends and money. 
I became the United States bodybuilding champion, one of the strongest men in the world, and a wrestling star. Everything I asked for in that prayer came true. Another thing I want to tell you, fam, you may not want to believe me. I met a lady probably about 10 years ago in Iron Gate. I ran on outside Cliff Ford. She said, you don't remember me, boy, but me and your grandmother prayed to bring you back. To bring you back. I died at, from that push. Didn't even know it and came back, according to old people that live around that area. So so that's why in that area, they always call me the the gifted one because... I, you know, I faced death when I was six years old. He pushed me in that creek, put that big dent in my head. His name was Jerry Hayes. And everybody around the area, though, they, they thought I was dead. Everybody thought I was dead. My grandmother got me to pray with her. I got down my knees. I prayed my grandmother to be strong like Samson, built like Hercules. And the reason I say built like Hercules, because Samson, according to the Bible, did not have a built. He looked like a normal man. You know, in fact, he was very deceiving. Look, he looked like a weakling, a wimp. He looked like Pee Wee Herman, according to the Bible. Hercules was, was a gladiator, was built up and was built. And a lot of friends, I became everything. In 19, when I graduated from high school, I graduated with the same clothes I started school with. And a year later, I was making $75,000 a year, one year after I finished high school. So this is pretty much some of my life when I grew up to be a professional wrestler. But later on, I'm going to get into how I got my start from uh wrestling and how i got started in uh uh weightlifting uh we still got about five more minutes tony yes i got five more minutes to talk to y'all and within them five minutes i i just want to say this first i want to thank marty and the pharaoh for giving me and larry this opportunity like i said before this is my first time doing this and I know a lot of wrestlers uh, that helped me. Uh, a lot of people helped me along the way. And I like to use this broadcast not to to blow my own horn, but to let y'all know that in America, no matter how poor you are, you can be laid raised in a slave shack where you have to go and haul your water. You can have an outhouse. You can have a bucket underneath your bed. You know, you can eat one meal a day. We were so poor that by we used to wait till the end of the day when mother came home from work. My mother worked from seven o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Every time I see a 7-Eleven show, I would think of my mom because then was her hour from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. But at, at 11 p.m., I got my first meal for that day. And we were so poor, we didn't have dishes. So my mother would put newspaper on the floor and whatever leftover they had for the, for the place, she would dump them on the on that piece of paper and we sat there we had no silverware with our hands and we would eat like just like this and then we crawl underneath our bed and go to sleep but my mother didn't give up on us she stayed in there until we was all big healthy and strong kid her name was miss beatrice james white uh my grandmother was lilia james caswell my father's last name was, was charles my dad was Norris. I got a brother named Norris, a brother named Walter, and a, and a brother named Charles that I knew of. I got a, a brother and a sister named Shirley and Sherman that I never met. I got three sisters that I don't know their names, and I and I never met them. So I've used this opportunity to bring to light some of the people from the beginning of my life up until where I'm at now. So y'all can kind of, when y'all see me, y'all see me more than just being, you know, WWE Tag Team Champion, Rocket Johnson, and Mr. USA. We all know that about the wrestler, but have you ever thought about how did that wrestler grow up? And this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to let y'all know how I grew up. I grew up in poverty. I worked, I worked my butt off, and I believe in my country, and I believe in my God. So, uh, Larry, anything you'd like to say to the fans? Thank the fans for this wonderful segment, Marty and the Pharaoh for giving us this opportunity. Tony, you've already said it all, man. This they are here to listen to you talk. Right. You tell some great stories. I have been on the road with you for thousands and thousands of miles. And we sat and we talked about and all we these talk stories. about these stories. We talk about every. This is the great. And when I hear them here, it's the same stories I've heard on the road. For for years, decades. When when, when next week, you know, after I left the the, the diagnostic, I don't mean to cut you off, Larry. No. After I left the diagnostic center, we didn't even get into the diagnostic. When, when that's what I'm getting ready to tell the folks about. I'm gonna tell the people about about my life uh, with the diagnostic center 
and the comparison between that and the Virginia Negro Baptist Chimney Home. And I want to talk to y'all a little bit. I don't know if I'll be offensive by doing it. A little bit about homosexuality. That's one of the things that I learned about at both places. I was not involved in none of it, but some of the things that I saw, and I've seen a lot of it over the years. I've seen a lot of stuff because y'all know I'm kind of goofy anyway. I like for women to step on my face. You know, that's not the, <laughs> the most thing you want to brag about too much. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but, but, but I learned a little thing about these two things, and then there's some things about my own personal experience with uh, pedophile that uh, we will get in on the next section. So I'm trying to use the, the, the first part of, of this thing with Molly to get y'all to understand me, what make me me, why I'm the way I am, why I think the way I am, what happened in my life to make me the way that I am. You know, what happened to you when you're young affects you when you're getting old. So a lot of things that, you know, if you understand a person's childhood, you understand that person. Because we all raised with different experience in life. And I'm going to try to share some of my experience. Some I'm very proud of. Some I'm not so proud of because, you know, none of us are perfect. And most definitely I'm not perfect. So I'm just trying to explain to y'all how I grew up and how life was, not just for black people. Because if I want to make everything black and white, we're all Americans. And poverty hit all of us. All of us get in fights. All of us get robbed. All of us get abused. All of us go through hard time, good time, happy time, sad time. We all do. We're human. We live here on earth. We live in the greatest country in the history of the world. And once again, if it wasn't for Marty and the Pharaoh, I've, I've been on a lot of shows. Everybody got a flow map for what I need to talk about with Marty and the Pharaoh. They said, Tony, you talk about what you want to talk about. This is your hour. You do it the way you want to do it. So this is going to finish episode number one. Number one. Of Tuesdays with Tony. And like they used to say back in the old days, we'll see you again. Be there. You can see I'm at my heart. I got my favorite girl, Chana, right here beside me. Got me press slamming somebody, a little action figure. So we're going to start this off. Now, in school, one of the things that I would really, really like to do, is because of uh, I live in America, and I'm very proud of being in America, and I miss the USA. So I'm going to start off like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stands, one nation, under God, in the visible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless the USA. Now, a lot of people uh, over the years, I'm sure y'all hear a lot of stuff about wrestlers. But I was just talking to Larry and Marty the other day. I said, you know, I read some stuff on the paper about guys that I travel with, like Ric Flair and Wahoo McDaniel, Carlite Bill. And I never knew much about them until I went to Wikilink and found out uh, stuff about them. But I don't want y'all to go to Wikilink to find out about me. Now, I was born in a little small town called Clifton Ford, Virginia. And uh, I don't remember much about my childhood in Clifton Ford, but I do remember that I grew up in a town called Lowmore, Virginia. Now, Lowmore was a small town between Covington and Clifton Ford. It was uh, eight miles from Covington, and it was... Uh, Four, mi four miles from Clifton Ford. We live in a little, what you call, in the old days, you call them like a, a slave shack. I mean, it had dirt floors. 
Uh, you have wooden walls, and in the winter time, we we didn't get much snow up in the uh, up up in the hill. Uh, they're called the Allegheny Mountains. You got the Allegheny uh, Mountains, and you got uh, 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 you got the Blue Ridge Mountains, and uh, it was all mountain region. I mean, right on the the, the border of uh, if you looked up on the map, look at Loma, it's right on the border of uh, Virginia and West Virginia. So this is kind of like northern uh, of Northwest Virginia, where I raised up at, where life in uh, at that time in the fifties and in the sixties was hard for everybody. I mean, I used to wake up at nighttime uh, whenever it snow and shake snow off my blanket because the snow would come through the cracks of, of the house. We didn't have running water, so what you had to do, you had to lower a bucket down in the well. The well set out in the front of the yard, and you draw that water in, and that was the water you used to wash with and to drink with. Now, my mother had nine kids, so you have what we call a foot tub. So you take that water, you heat it up, heat it up on the stove, uh, you heat that water, that's, I, I, this is my neighborhood, you heat that water up on the stove, you dump it in, and you take a bath. Well, every, every one of my brothers always wanted to be the first <laughs> the first in that bath water. You can understand why. Because with nine kids, by the time you got to that nine kid, you were taking a mud bath. <laughs> 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 so if you're the first kid, then the only way you get fresh water, you got to draw more water, set it on the stove, heat it up, and pour it into this foot stuff. Now, you know how all you guys, when you want to use the restroom or something, you just get up and just walk through the house or walk, you know, down the hall and use the restroom. We didn't have that. We have what we call an outhouse. Now, the outhouse was set on the outside away from your house. You wanted away from your house and, and you used the house out. Uh, but at nighttime or in the wintertime, they had a slop bucket, as we call it, that, that was underneath the bed. And you take that slop bucket and you set on that bucket. You do what you got to do. In the morning, you got to go dump that bucket. That's how you, we used the bathroom when I was a kid. Now, <laughs> one day, uh, we used to play jokes on each other, too. I got to tell you the jokes we used to play. My brother would go, like, and kill a snake, you know, and I'm sitting in the outhouse, you know, looking around. You got to look for snakes when you live in Virginia. You know, you, you have water marks on, you have copperheads, you have snakes that would bite you and kill you. You know, there were a lot of poisonous snakes down uh, down south, you know. So my brother, them, they, they, they used to light, uh, uh, set something on fire and and stick it underneath the, the, the outhouse and smoke would come in the outhouse and he, they, would, they would lock the door from the outside where I came at and they'd holler, fire, fire, and I'm banging on the door, I'm trying to get out, you know, and, and, you know, with my pants halfway down to my knees. That was another joke. Sometimes they would catch a snake and they would kill it and they would throw it in there and shut the door on me real fast. Ah, jump up there. So, but we had fun teasing, <laughs> teasing each other. Thing. Well, one time I did something that, was not a joke. It was an accident. I got up. I had to go to the restroom real bad, real bad. So I got up and um, I kicked over that slop jaw, jaw, and everything that was in it from all the kids, my grandmother, my mom, just went everywhere. It was all over the floor. You know, said, my grandmother never got mad a day in life, was mad at me that day. She said, boy, if you don't get up there and clean that mess up, you better. I'm going to tie your hat all the pieces. If you don't clean that up, boy, you get up there, you clean that up right now. <laughs> 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 I go, you okay, grandma? Okay, grandma. So I got teased. By the the book, my brother, they call me Stinky because I stunk up the house. I, I was called Stinky for for a long, a long, long time. Then I remember one day I never saw my father yet, and I think I was around. Oh my goodness, how old was I when the first time I saw him? I'm just making a guess here. I want to say I was seven, the first time I, I I saw my dad, and he came. And my mother said, your dad is coming home today. I want you kids to clean up the yard, you know, clean things up. So we said, okay, mom. So I was out sweeping the yard. Now, our yard was dirt. The, inside our house, we didn't have wooden floors or floors like you guys got. Like I said, it was old slave shacks where the slaves lived there years and years ago when America had slaves. So the floor was dirt. So I would try to get out of cleaning, doing my chores. 
So uh, and how my mother knew if I swept the floor, because if with a dirt floor, when you step on it, dust would come up if it had not been uh, swept. But if you sweep it, when you step on it, no dust came up. So my mother, when she stepped on that floor, and she see that dust rise up from the floor. And every move you make, dust will keep rising, rising. By the end of the day, the whole house is full of dust. You can see it's like a, a cloud. It's like a dust storm being in your house. And then another thing, we had these old uh, stove that... At, at the end of the year, your walls could be white or blue or green, no matter what color your walls is. At the end of at the end of winter, your walls were black because they had to suck. Would get all over everything on your clothes, on everything. Don't you know suck? So that was there every year. You have to definitely the spring cleaning. Now you have to clean the wall, clean the suck off off, off everything. But anyway, the first time I saw my father, he walked in. He had a three piece suit on. I was sweeping the front yard. And a, a guy lived across the street, lived with Miss Keisha. And his name was Tippy Tom because we called him Tippy Tom because he was real, real tall. He probably about 6'6", six, six, but back back in the 50s, you know, a guy 6'6", six, six, or in the 50s, 6'6", was considered, you know, pretty tall guy. You know, not like today, you know, we got seven footers. But back then, if you were 6'6", six, six, you was compared to a pretty tall guy. So we called him Tippy Tom. He was carrying two water pails. And he looked at me and said, boy. You know who that man is? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I think that's my dad. He said, yeah, that's your dad, boy. So then I came up and I said, how you doing, dad? He said, you know who I am, boy? I said, yeah, I, I, I know who you are. He said, where your mom? I said, she's at work. He said, I got something for you, boy. Come here. He gave me a, play, a payday candy bar. That was the first thing I ever got from my father. And the only thing I've got, never gave me anything out that paid that, that, that candy bar, gave me that candy bar. So then he came home, him and my mom, they got along for a little while. He went out to look for work, but in Lomore, if you didn't work for the railroad, the only other work you did was uh, for farmers. You know, go work for the different farmers because there was, there was only one store that was called the Commissary. It was owned by the North and Rest of the Railroad. So he... If things didn't work out too well for him, he just kept getting angrier and angrier. So he tried to make the best of it. So I'm on one day, he's going to plant a garden. So me and him, we went way out. We dug up. We didn't have tractors or cultivated stuff. So we used a pick, a rake, and a hoe. He did it all manual. Three three items here. A, 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 a rake, a, a, a hoe, and a pick. That was it. You use the pick to break it up. You pick all the rocks out. Then you use the hole to make your rows and everything. And then smooth it out with the rake. And then you cut your trenches. You plant your stuff. Well, anyway, we had a cherry tree sitting there. So I said, oh, that's pretty nice. Them cherries look good. I ain't eating all day long. I'm going to go get me some cherry. So I walk across my dad's garden to get these cherries. So when my dad came home, came back, and he was drunk. I don't know where he get money for liquor from. And came home drunk. And who been in my garden? So I didn't want my brothers to get in trouble. So I said, I did. I said, I wanted to get some cherry. He whooped the hell out of me that night. I got my first whooping by my dad. So my dad gave me two things when he came home. A candy bar and an ass whooping. So that's what I meet with my father. One day, my dad said, boy, you want to make some money? I said, yeah. He said, come on with me. So we go down to a place called Scrapper's Corner in Lowmore. If people that live in that area, they know what I'm talking about, especially the older people. And what they do, the railroad men with gamma at this corner. See, they didn't have nightclubs and places like that for black people to go to. So you have to make the best of, of what you have. So they had this corner where all the black guys would hang out after work and everything. They stayed there until, you know, 12, 1 o'clock. Uh, uh, in the morning, and they shoot dice. It was, dice was the thing. They're shooting that dice, you know. So, and they have fights, stage fights, you know, like boxing and stuff like that. So, my dad said, "The moment I taught you how to hit a man, but my dad had a belief. He said, if he ever hit you, and you don't go down, he's gonna walk around behind you to see what's holding you up. That was his 
he believed, you know, he boxed a little bit in the military. He was a cook in the military, but he was on the boxing team, too. So he knew exactly how to, to where to strike that. Tell me to catch him right on that chin right there. You hit him hard, you get right on that chin. Forget about all this here. Don't hit him in the head. You're going to hurt your hands. Catch him right on that chin. So I would try to put my weight behind and hit you right on that chin and knock you out. And then he told me I was going to fight this guy. And they bet some money. It was $5 on the table. Black man for a black guy, $5. That was a lot of money. That was a weak pay for most people back in them days. So I wanted that. My dad wanted that five bucks. So he said, boy, if you lose this fight, you're going to get it worse when you got home. So I kept fighting this guy. I just wouldn't give up. But he busted my lip, black in my eyes. He beating the crap on me. Fan, I saw that open, and I co-cocked him. I saw his leg gives a little bit, and I hit him again. His leg gives him more, and then I just drew back, gave him everything out there. I dropped him. I dropped him. I was so proud of myself. I couldn't hardly stand up myself, you know. I was sore for a week. You know, my mother wanted to kill him for, for doing that to me, you know. But anyway, he got his $5. Fairly one day, the last time I, up to the last time I saw my dad. Can I cut in here? Yes. What did you get? Because you said he would be, you, he asked if you wanted to make some money. I didn't. Did well, you I, get any of that? Yeah, I, I got some fat back and some, and, and, and some navy beans. <laughs>